want to take a quick second to thank Universal Yums for sponsoring the channel once again. As you all know, Universal Yums is a box subscription service, and when you sign up, they send you awesome treats from all around the world. They recently sent me one from Colombia, and it had these absolutely delicious passion fruit uh, bubble pops, kind of like a blow pop here in the U.S. They were absolutely delicious, along with a whole bunch of other stuff in the box. If it sounds like something you're interested in, something you want to try with your kids, with your family, or for yourself, just head down into the description and click that link and pick you up a box. It really helps out the channel. So, that said, thanks again to Universal Yums for supporting the channel, and let's jump right into tonight's stories. Grave Consequences I graduated from high school a few years back. I still live with my parents, but I'm using this time to my advantage. They're kind enough not to charge rent, and that allows me the ability to save up almost every penny I make. The hope is that I can one day start up a small but legitimate business and move into my own apartment. You know, the American dream. You see, much to my parents' dismay, I don't have a steady job. I prefer to take a DIY approach and be my own boss. I buy and resell things online and take up odd jobs here and there to supplement my income. With the help of social media and Craigslist, I'm able to regularly mow lawns in spring and summer, rake leaves in autumn, and shovel driveways in winter. Eventually, I'll have enough to buy a decent car and reach clients outside of town and maybe even hire a few lackeys. What I'm here to share with you, however, is an incident that occurred almost two years ago, one that keeps me on edge to this day. In my first year of business, I introduced a flower delivery service. Depending on the season, I'd either pick flowers from around town or buy them from the local florist, then deliver them to a person of my client's choosing. Though it wasn't my most popular service, it did bring in some good money. You'd be surprised at how much folks are willing to pay to woo a loved one with some plants. In all that time that I biked flowers back and forth from person to person, I only ever picked up one regular. His name was Red, and he was absolutely infatuated with his girlfriend, Clara. Once a month, I would deliver a dozen roses to a local hotel where she worked. No matter how many times I went over there with the same bouquet, she always acted surprised and delighted to no end. They really did have something special, and I was happy to be a part of their lives, at least in some small way. But then February rolled around. Albeit my least popular job, I do gain a little traction during the Valentine season. Along with the additional customers, Bren goes all out and has me deliver three bouquets on the week leading up to the holiday. Between these deliveries and keeping up with my usual services, February beats the hell out of me. This particular Valentine's week was a little different. I was getting close to the big day, and I hadn't received a single order from Red. I usually don't get attached to my clients, but I was quite fond of Red and Clara. Because of this, I decided to reach out to him. I tried calling him. No dice. Nothing but dial tones and voicemail. I thought about riding over to the hotel to ask Clara about it, but that would cut into the rest of the work I had lined up for the day. With no viable options available to me, I simply went about my day and kept a positive mindset. Something felt off, but I was sure it was nothing to worry about. The next day, Red called back. He was fine, but there was something he wanted to discuss with me. Of all the phone conversations I've ever had, this one tops the list for the most bizarre. Red hadn't ordered any flowers because he was getting ready to pop the question to Clara. He wanted the lack of gifts that week to leave her confused and then catch her completely off guard on Valentine's Day by asking for her hand in marriage. I was happy for them, but that's when the conversation took an unexpected turn. Red didn't have a ring. He was wealthy and could afford whatever jewelry he wanted, but not just any engagement ring would suffice. He wanted his mother's ring, the one his father proposed with. It was the only one he felt was fitting, the only one worthy enough to be wrapped around her finger. There was just one problem. His mother was buried with it. And then came the weird part. 
Red offered me $10,000 in cash to dig up his mother's grave and retrieve the ring from her dead finger. He said that he would do it himself, but he didn't have the nerve. He couldn't bring himself to defile her gravesite like that. He wasn't exactly comfortable with me doing it either, but he truly felt this was the only way he could propose to his one true love. I pleaded with the guy. I really did. I told him to go to Jared's. I mean, women love rings from Jared's. Seriously. But alas, he wouldn't budge on the matter. And whether it was the allure of money that I could use to expand my business or the desire to help out a desperate friend in need, I grudgingly accepted the job. I'm not going to make any excuses here. I know you think I'm crazy for doing it, and yes, I most certainly was. I know this now. Hell, I, I knew it then too, but have you ever looked back on something you did in your past and wondered what the hell was I thinking? Well, this is one of those moments for me. And try as one might, you can't go back and change the stupid shit you've done. This is something I'll just have to live with. Under the light of a full moon, I blinked over to the cemetery. As conspicuous as the shovel protruding from my backpack looked, I managed to make it the whole way there without any trouble. After passing the black entrance gates, I laid my bike down and set out on foot. The graveyard was consumed by a late winter chill and an uneasy silence. My footsteps cut through the crisp night air, creating echoes that danced from headstone to headstone. I turned back from time to time and told myself it was to check for passing cars, but really, I was afraid of ghosts lurking in the shadows. I never really believed in them, but being surrounded by hundreds of buried corpses in the middle of the night can do a number on your psyche. Growing more nervous with each passing moment, I trotted to the back of the cemetery in haste. My hurried pace was soon impeded by a fresh pile of white marble. Upon was etched the name Abigail Grovewood in a stunningly elegant font. This was it. This was Red's mother, right where he said she'd be. It was time to get down to business. In the hopes of saving at least a little bit of face, I will say that in this moment, what I was doing did feel deeply wrong on a moral level. I was about to vandalize and rob the grave of a deceased stranger. She didn't deserve this, and I very well knew it. How would I live with myself knowing that I disturbed her peaceful slumber? That question had a simple answer. With $10,000 in my pocket, that's how. I'd come too far to turn back, and I foolishly felt that this was the best way to further my financial endeavors. May God have mercy on my soul. The whole process took about six and a half hours, a little less time than I expected. I suppose shoveling driveways every year prepared me for this pivotal yet strange moment in my life. After all was said and done, I looked at the coffin below and panted profusely. Despite being utterly exhausted, I had no time to waste. Daylight was on its way, and I had to get the hell out of Dodge before it shrouded the land of the dead. With how narrow the hole was, there was no way I could open up the coffin by conventional means. Adding insult to injury for poor Abigail, I had to use my shovel to break through the confines of her deathbed. Eventually, I desecrated the entire cover, allowing me ample room to retrieve the ring no matter which hand it was on. Victory was within reach. Before taking my prize, I looked at the woman I was about to steal from. The sight of her corpse was a grotesque one. She'd only been buried about a year, so her flesh was not fully decayed yet. It sat on her skin like battered on an undercooked drumstick. To top it off, maggots crawled around every inch of her surface. It was sickening. Just as I was about to reach past the flesh-eating bugs and grab Abigail's hand, something crazy happened. It was dark, that's for sure, but I swear I saw her begin to sit up in her grave. The movement was subtle, but it was enough for me to take notice. I was startled, but I took a few seconds for the gravity of the situation to sink in. When it did, I became so spooked that I hightailed it out of there without a second thought. And that is the gist of my late night adventure. Pretty lame, right? I went through all of that grief just to chicken out at the last minute. As 
pathetic, I know, but you weren't there to experience it. As I climbed out of the hole, I thought I felt something brush against my ankle, perhaps Abigail's brittle hands attempting to pull me to my death. As I ran to my bike, I pictured her crawling up from her earthy tomb and chasing me down the road until I was inevitably captured. This was the single most frightening night of my life. I was scared shitless and didn't give a flying fuck about Red or the other $10,000. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. Of course, upon arriving home, logic set in and I realized the error of my ways. It was entirely possible that Abigail was still as stone and I had only thought I'd saw her move. What I felt against my ankle was more than likely maggots crawling up my pant leg. I had let the eerie atmosphere of the cemetery get the better of me and was now out ten grand and a good friend. Just my goddamn luck. I almost went back, but the sun was beginning to rise. I couldn't risk being spotted and going to jail, though that was a likely outcome regardless. Instead, I wallowed in self-pity and ignored Red's calls for a couple of days. Soon enough, my failed grave robbery was all over the news. But here's the thing. When the police discovered my handiwork, something was profoundly amiss. Abigail's casket was empty. The Woman in the Front Yard I woke up from a dream tonight. The light bleeding into the room around the corners of my blinds was weak and gray, and for a moment I was confused as to whether it was becoming day or night outside. The clock above my TV said it was 7 o'clock, but that wasn't really helpful. Sighing, I got up to look out at my front yard for some clue or a sign. The vinyl blind slipped out of my hand as I tugged it down, snapping up to the top of the window with an angry rolling flutter. Stupid fucking piece of... There was a woman out in my front yard, dressed in something that reminded me of a toga or something else they may have worn in ancient Greece or Rome, or kind of like the Statue of Liberty wore, though this woman didn't look much like the green giant. No, this woman was beautiful, tall and muscular with long golden hair and strong features that looked almost alien in their perfect asymmetry. I'd often had the same thought about runway models. They were made to look so different from people that I typically found it off-putting. But this woman? No. The strangeness of her beauty only enhanced its appeal. The grace of her movements as she paced across the yard, the solemn expression on her face as she stared resolutely forward, it all served to make her seem more real and more special. My breath caught my throat as I tried to think of what to do. Should I go out and introduce myself to her, see if she needed help? I knew I must look a mess, but if I waited to clean up, she might be... Wait, was she pulling a chain behind her? She was. A black heavy chain, as thick as her arm, trailed out behind her. I could tell by the way it drug along the ground that it was extremely heavy, but she walked on with it clenched casually in her left fist as though it weighed nothing at all. I felt the first flutter of unease stirring in my belly. Why was she out there? Who was she, and why was she dressed like that? It was then the chain scraped its way over the flagstone walk that led up to my front door. It gave me a three-foot window to see what she was dragging along without it being obscured by the tall grass. I watched the dark lynx glide across like dull scales of some massive snake, and then, at the end of the chain, there was a large hook of jagged, silvery metal. All flat panes and sharp edges, the glow of my porch light made it glitter as it scraped across the walk and back into the grass on the other side. My mouth went dry as I stepped back and found my phone tangled up in the sheets. 911, what's your emergency? I, um, there's a woman in my front yard. She's dressed funny. I mean, like, she's in a costume or something, like a toga. Alright, what's she doing? Um, 
she's just walking around out there, I guess. I, I don't know why she's out here. Does she appear to be injured or intoxicated? I don't think so. I don't know. It's getting dark, but I can still hear her pretty good. But no, she doesn't seem drunk or hurt that I can tell. Do you know who this woman is? What? Uh, no, of course not. Why would I call if I knew her? Why did you call, sir? Uh, well, she's like trespassing, right? And I don't know, I just... Oh shit, I, I didn't tell you. She's dragging a chain with a hook on it. What? I know this sounds weird, but she's got a big fucking metal chain, right? And she's dragging it behind her. It's like, get over here, right? I, I thought it was like a spear, I think. But when I first saw it, it freaked me out, so I called. Sir, have you been drinking or using any other controlled substances tonight? What? No, I, I just woke up. I see. So it's possible this was all part of some dream. Uh, no. Look, just a second. Yeah, okay, no, she's still out there. I'm wide awake, I'm sober, and I'm talking to you, and I fucking see her out there. She's just walking. Oh, shit. She just stopped and is looking at me. Fuck, I can hear her now. She's humming, I can... I can feel through the window. What does it sound like? What is it? Fuck, how do I know, man? It sounds like humming. I, fuck, I don't feel right. Look, get someone over here now, okay? I need help. I need help getting rid of her. Getting rid of her? Why would you want to do that? What? What the fuck did... Look, all I want is to talk to someone else. Not trying to be rude, but you're fucking weird, man, and you're shit at your job. I want a supervisor or the police or something. Hello? Hello? I looked back out the window and saw that the woman had moved over to the tree in the far corner of the yard. My mother said my great-grandfather had planted that tree over a century ago, and all these years later, even its smallest branches ran thick and stretched wide. It was one of the lowest of these that the woman secured her chain, the glimmering hook twisting in the air and sending out twinkles of light across the yard. As for the woman herself, she turned back to me, her arms lifted an invitation or offering. I felt things stirring in me. I wanted to go to her, to be with her, to do what would please her, even if it meant something terrible. That strange, melodic humming noise kept rolling through me, each wave washing away more of my resolve and my fear. Soon enough, I would just go on out, give her what she wanted, what she wanted, what... I suddenly jumped as a hissing child's voice sprang out of the phone still dangling in my hand. Yes! Give her your flesh as a token of your worship. It's the least you can do for the honor she bestows upon you. I dropped the phone, staring at it like a snake as I backed out of the room. I just needed to think for a minute. Maybe I should go outside, but that seemed wrong. So if I could just think, if the humming would stop for a minute and I could just think. The humming fell away. As silence rushed back in, I felt her eyes on me, inside me. When I turned to the closet window, I felt little surprise that she was standing near the house now, looking at me with a sad longing that broke the last of me. She was so hungry and so giving, and I should be ashamed for hesitating to give it all that I had to her. I rushed to open the front door, but she stopped me without moving or uttering a word. Not yet. First, I had to write this account. The record would act as a witness, and the witnessing was a powerful part of these things. Every person that sees will feed her a little. Every thought and belief will bring her back a bit of her old glory. Of the times when she was known as the spring mother, the lady-in-waiting, the lover. A thing to be loved and feared, but above all, a thing to be fed. It had been so long for her. I try not to cry as I write this last, but I feel so sorry for what she's endured. I try not to rush these words, but I'm so anxious to run to her. I know that when I do, she'll sweep me up in her soft, strong arms and gently place me on what they once called the silver cradle. She will crawl beneath and open herself wide, not letting a single drop go to waste. 
I know all this because she knows this. Because she wants me to know what it is to come and share in the beauty of it all. And oh, it will be so beautiful. I have to stop here. I'm trembling too much. I have to go to her now. Thank you for listening to this, for helping me make my offering, my life, mean something in service to her. It's such a blessing. I don't... Such a blessing. The Elevator Code As a freelance convention planner, I stay at many hotels over the course of a year. I spend about a week per trip in an all-expenses-paid suite of my choosing, doing nothing but studying the location and interviewing the staff on hand to get a feel for the hotel and its traffic. Then I spend another week organizing the event and ensuring my client is satisfied with my plans. There's a little bit more to it, but that's the overall gist of the job. If you can get over the constant jet lag, it's not a bad gig. In all my years of planning conventions, I must have stayed at over a hundred different hotels. With similar floor plans, architecture, and staff training, they all blend together in my mind, but one in particular will always stay with me. The Grovewood Inn, located just on the outskirts of Cape Cod. That one kept me up for many nights, even after I left. At first, my trip to the Grovewood Inn seemed mostly forgettable. The convention I was planning was a glorified book club meeting for a group of older women and some local authors. The service, food, and layout of the hotel were average and unexciting. The only thing I liked about the place was Clara, the desk clerk. I'd even had her out on a date had she not been married. I had planned boring conventions and been to many subpar hotels, but this trip was remarkably mind-numbing. I couldn't wait to be done with it. One night at the end, after a long day of mundane event planning, I flipped on the TV, poured a glass of wine, and climbed into bed. I grabbed the program guide from my bedside table and looked it over, hoping to find the porn networks. As I glanced through the channel listing, something at the bottom of the page caught my eye. Written crudely in permanent marker was the following. Elevator code. 030806 b one zero four. 02, 07, B2, 05, 01. This was odd. I knew of hotels that had pin pads on their elevators, usually to prevent children from using them, but the Grovewood Inn was not one of them. Plus, most pin pad elevators only required a four digit code. Intrigued, I decided to call up to the front desk to find out more. I was sure the code would turn out to be something trivial and uninteresting. But it was, at the very least, an excuse to talk to Clary again. Though unreciprocated, I enjoyed flirting with her, if for no other reason than to hear her infectious laughter. A sip of wine and a few failed pickup lines later, I was back at square one. Clara didn't know anything about it, claiming there were no devices in the entire building that would require a code like that, much less one of the elevators. She did, however, point out that the numbers on the code aligned with every floor of the hotel, one through eight, plus the two basement levels. We both found this odd, but ultimately couldn't make sense of it. After getting off the phone with Clara, my curiosity got the best of me. I left my room, walked over to the elevator, and stepped inside. I then pressed the buttons in the order they were written on my channel guide, just to see if anything would happen. Much to my disappointment, the elevator did nothing but take me to every floor of the hotel before finally stopping at the lobby. The front desk was in eye shot of the elevator, so I quickly hit the button for my floor, not wanting to explain to Clara what I was up to. Though I didn't have a shot with her, it still would have been embarrassing to tell her I was spending my night playing around in the elevator. Luckily, I was able to escape unseen. Upon stepping foot back onto my floor, I noticed the member of the cleanup crew walking down the hall. And then it hit me. The staff never used the patron elevators. They had their own service elevator to get from floor to floor without impeding the travel of guests. It may sound ridiculous, but I needed to know if the code worked in that elevator, if for not no other reason than to placate my undying curiosity. I inconspicuously made my way down the hall, heading to the service elevator. 
Once there, the familiar sting of disappointment set in. A staff card was required to gain access, no doubt to keep guests from using it. Feeling defeated and realizing how crazy I was letting boredom make me, I walked back to my room. After a few more glasses of wine, I drifted off and entered a long, peaceful, alcohol-induced slumber. I woke many hours later to sunlight flooding my room and the familiar sound of a vacuum next door. Cleanup is always in full force early morning at the hotels. When the initial grogginess of waking up wore off, something came to mind. Something that caused me to jump to my feet and immediately exit my room. There in the middle of the hall was the cleaning cart, and there was no staff in sight. Hanging from a lanyard was the maid's staff card, ripe for the taking. This was it. This was my chance. Maybe it was the slight hangover I had, or perhaps it truly was the monotony of planning a less than exciting convention, but I grabbed that card and ran to the service elevator like it was the last chance I had at having some adventure during my trip. Something about that code was calling to me. It was a mystery I desperately felt the need to solve. Upon swiping the maid's card and entering the elevator, I quickly punched in the code and waited. At first, nothing happened. The elevator didn't move, but the buttons all remained illuminated. I thought that maybe I had somehow busted the thing, but the preceding moments proved this theory wrong. Without warning, the elevator raced up to the heights of the hotel, ascending much faster than normal. The digital readout above counted the floors up to eight, and then kept going until it reached twelve. This was bizarre, as the Grovewood Inn only had eight floors, and there was no discernible reason the elevator should have been able to reach that height. By all accounts, I would have been in the sky at that point. After a few moments, the elevator door opened, revealing behind it a grand ballroom, the likes of which I've never seen before in any of the hotels I'd been to. Victorian-era chandeliers hung from the ceiling, beautiful silk banners danced from wall to wall, and hundreds of people dressed in old-fashioned attire and elegant facewear, waltzed as a large band played a catchy tune. My jaw was on the floor. It's hard to explain, but a romantic fog filled the air. I watched as masked patrons danced in unison and partook in lavish festivities, completely oblivious to my presence. For a moment or two, I completely forgot about the hotel below, awestruck by the scene before me. Something about it was absolutely intoxicating. Just as I was about to step out of the elevator, the music stopped. All at once, the ballroom guests turned around to face me and held their gaze with mine, almost as if peering into my very soul. It became quickly apparent that I was not welcome there, an uninvited and unwanted visitor in a room I was never supposed to reach. It was clear to me that it was time to leave. I tried pressing the button for the lobby, but it wouldn't light up. I tried floors two, three, and four. No dice. The elevator was stagnant, and I was trapped. I looked back over to the crowd, and to my horror, they had begun walking into my direction. Their march was slow, but without a working elevator, I had no means of escape. I was at the mercy of the ballroom and its occupants now, no matter what that fate entailed. With little in the way of options, I attempted to converse with the group. Who are you? What do you want with me? My query was met with little reaction. The only response I received was the continued sound of footsteps on the ballroom floor. Frightened of what was to come next, I backed up as far as the elevator walls would allow, a mouse cornered in a bird's cage. Just as the vultures closed the gap between us, an explosion of fire emerged from the background, overcoming the guest and engulfing the entire room in flames. I began to cough uncontrollably from the toxic smoke that loomed above. Beads of sweat the size of pearls dripped down my cheeks to top it off. The guests were still there, standing still at the foot of the elevator, somehow unfazed by the fiery heat around them. In between coughs, I managed to offer them one last question, though I knew it would probably go unanswered. What do you want? A woman from the front of the crowd stepped forward. She wore a fox mask and a slight grin, though her lips would soon spread apart to speak. We want to be saved. At this moment, the flames took flight, rising to the highest heights of the ballroom. 
Molten skin dripped from the woman's frame like candle wax as her features morphed into a gruesome arrangement of congealed flesh and bubbling blisters. Won't you save us? In a grotesque slur of unnatural movement, the woman stumbled into my direction, arms outstretched. I stood still in terror as her burnt fingers made their way to my neck. Just as she was about to make contact, the door shut behind her and the lights went out. The bulb in the elevator, the fire in the ballroom. It was all gone. The energy around me had dissipated abruptly, leaving nothing but pitch blackness in its place. Somehow, I was alone. A few moments of confusion passed, followed by a loud roar from the elevator shaft below. All at once, everything sprung back to life, save for my fox-masked assailant. As the elevator dropped, I watched the digital readout count backward from twelve. Eventually, I was back in familiar territory, safe and sound on the ground floor. Before the doors could fully open, I made a mad dash for the front desk. Clara! Hey, what's got you so frazzled? And what were you doing in the service elevator? If I told her what I'd seen, she'd think I was crazy. Instead, I composed myself and asked for some information. Did this hotel ever have a twelfth floor? Clara looked very surprised by my question. Yes, it did. The Grovewood Inn was originally almost twice this height, but a lot of it burned up in a bad fire, so it had to be reconstructed. The top floor was a ballroom, but that was a very long time ago. She pointed at a framed picture on the wall behind her, dated 1913. Why do you ask? No reason, just curious, that's all. I promptly made my way back to my room and reflected on everything. I wondered if I'd seen the picture without realizing it and dreamed up my elevator escapade. I discarded this thought rather quickly, sure that I was wide awake when it happened. I thought it might have been something in the wine, but that was equally unlikely. There was no logical explanation for what occurred. And that's about it. I never found out exactly what happened that day in the hotel. I mustered up enough courage to try the code again, but it didn't work. It seems like I was allowed a one-time glimpse into the past to look at what was before and what might still be today had the hotel not partially been destroyed. I only wish I could have taken part in the festivities before things went sour. Perhaps I could have somehow prevented the fire and saved the patrons just like the fox-masked woman wanted. All I can do now is look back on that day completely bewildered as I plan my next convention. The Clan of the Red Wolf I'm a student at Bridgewater State in Massachusetts. I share a dorm with my roommate Wallace. We both major in computer science and that's all we've ever talked about on the rare occasions that we actually speak to one another. We don't have much in the way of common ground. You see, Wallace is an odd guy. He's very socially awkward and doesn't have many friends, if any at all. I've only ever seen him talking to his professors, and one time the janitor. It's safe to say that Wallace is a recluse. Because of this, I didn't know much about him. I would love for the guy to open up more, but I'm not sure how to go about doing that. Besides, I have enough on my plate as it is between exams and the struggle of day-to-day finances. As cliche as it might sound, ramen is a popular meal on campus. Another one of Wallace's quirks is his obsessive-compulsive nature. He conducts himself in a very specific manner and has his daily routine mapped out to a T. It never changes. When he wakes up, he brushes his teeth, makes sure to gargle and spit exactly three times. He then puts on a striped shirt followed by khaki pants. His wardrobe never changes. He always arrives to class five minutes early and turns in his assignments a day before they're due. That's how it's always been. How do I know all of this? Well, being a socially awkward hermit, Wallace didn't tell me these things. I don't think he's even aware that his routine is a byproduct of OCD. I'm not claiming to know exactly what causes Wallace's actions, but I do minor in psychology. It's just something I've picked up on during the two years I've lived with the guy. It's almost impossible not to notice. Knowing Wallace's usual behavioral patterns, I noticed that something wasn't right. He began sleeping in his clothes, not brushing his teeth, and not passing in his assignments on time. Eventually, he stopped sleeping in the dorm altogether. 
After a day of not seeing him, things started looking grim. Despite not knowing Wallace all that well, I became worried. Depression and suicide rates are at an all-time high for our age group. I didn't want the poor guy to do something stupid. That worry justified me hacking into his laptop to see what he'd been up to. It was the only thing I could think to do. In finding his laptop and turning it on, I felt like a fool. The thing was as clean as a whistle, at least to my eyes. You see, though I pride myself in my tech know-how, Wallace is far more adept in the field. It was safe to say that I wouldn't find a shred of evidence as to where he might be or what he'd been doing. No journal entries, no browsing history, no nothing. Feeling anxious, I thought about any other potential ways to continue my hunt for the truth. And that's when something clicked. Like I said before, I sometimes saw Wallace talking to the janitor in the halls. He was the only person I had ever seen him speak with at length. It was possible that he knew something about Wallace's state of affairs. Later that night, I exited my dorm room and wandered the halls. Eventually, I found Chuck, the janitor. I tried to be gentle when confronting him, as he had his back to me and was known to be hard of hearing. Still, when I tapped him on the shoulder, he jumped. Holy cheese balls, you scared me half to death. Chuck laughed through his bushy gray mustache. What can I do for you, son? I told Chuck about my predicament and how I was concerned for Wallace, having not seen him in a while. Chuck's happy expression transformed into a look of unease and tension. He seemed to know a bit more than I did. Well, here's the thing. Wallace is a good kid, and we do chat from time to time. I happen to know where he might be, but I wouldn't feel comfortable blurting out the details of his social life to anyone who asked, even if you are his roommate. Social life? Wallace didn't have a social life. I pressured Chuck into letting me on the secret. I really laid it on thick, expressing a great deal of concern for Wallace's well-being. Being the nice old janitor that Chuck is, he eventually gave in. Okay, okay, I understand. Just please don't tell him that I told you, okay? I nodded, eagerly waiting for him to reveal Wallace's whereabouts. Wallace has been feeling really down lately. He's got no one to talk to but me. The kid wanted some friends, people that they could hang out with and talk to, you know? I listened closely for the details I so desperately sought after. So Wallace went on something called, uh, what was it? The Deep Web? On there he found a group of people, they called themselves Clan of the Red Wolf or something like that. They invited him to one of their meetings, that's probably where he is right now. He seemed pretty excited when he told me about it, in fact it's all he's been talking about for the past week. There. That was it. That was the bit of info I needed. The key to finding Wallace. I thanked Chuck and gave him a good night wave as I ran back to my dorm room. From the sounds of it, Wallace got himself involved with another group of people who share in his interest and eventually they invited him to hang out in real life. I had their quirky name, the Clan of Red Wolf, and that's all I needed to find them on the deep web myself. Soon enough, I was able to find my missing roommate. It took quite a while, but I finally managed to find a deep web form pertaining to the so-called clan. It contained nothing but a description and a series of videos. Here is the description as it appeared on the site. Welcome to your new belief system. We are the clan of the Red Wolf, and we're here to help. There are seven educational videos on this site, each tailored to a specific belief we want to share with you. You're asked to watch these programs to understand our doctrine. If you make it to the last one, you'll be invited into our den. Good luck. The summary was bizarre, but nothing less than what I'd expected. Scrolling further, I noticed that all the videos were titled similarly. Day 1, Day 2, and so on. Naturally, I watched them. The whole series reminded me of old war propaganda. It was made in the style of a vintage cartoon starring a wolf as the main focus. Not a normal wolf, but a cartoon character traversion of one. Picture a character similar to Wile E. Coyote. In each video, the wolf learned a new clan value from the campy male narrator. Not unlike old cartoons, the wolf comically goes against the narrator's wishes and suffers the consequences before learning his lesson. Every video ends with the narrator saying, Join the pack. You never have to feel alone again. I guessed that was the selling point for Lonely Wallace. I will share with you a bit of the transcript from each video, along with any points of interest. 
Video 1 was wildlife. Treat flora and fauna with dignity and respect. They're people too. Trees provide you with the air you breathe and animals share the earth with you, keeping you from being alone. They deserve more than you ever will. The wolf relieves himself on a tree. The tree falls on top of him, crushing his head and revealing the blood and brain matter inside. Video 2 was thicker than blood. Your blood is the most important material in your earthly vessel. The clan requires a sample upon joining our order. This is a requirement for all pledges. Our blood must flow as one for us to work together and save the planet. The wolf enters a room full of cloaked figures, presumably clan members. All members are in line, giving blood samples. The wolf refuses to have his blood drawn and walks away. A cloaked figure sneaks upon him and slices his throat with a dagger. The video focuses on the wolf bleeding out for a few moments before fading to black. Video 3 was Obey or Suffer. Remember what happened to our friend when he didn't give his blood to the cause? He didn't obey our rules, and so he's had to suffer the consequences. Remember, the clan's laws are important. You must obey or perish. Trust me, it's worth it. The video then showed the wolf bleeding out again, only now a few cloaked figures are on top of him, stabbing his corpse repeatedly. Video 4 explained the vow of secrecy. The clan of the Red Wolf is often misunderstood. Because of this, it's important to never tell anyone of our existence under any circumstances. You may only speak about clan activity with other clan members. Break this rule and you will perish. The wolf is shown taking to his wolf pals and showing them his new cloak. A cloaked figure walks in frame with what looks like a semi-automatic weapon and opens fire. The wolves fall to the ground dead. The cloaked figure gives a thumbs up before the video ends. Video 5 was Learn and Understand. If you're allowed into our inner sanctum, you'll be greeted with knowledge. We abide by the world of the Red Wolf, and you will too. You'll be expected to learn and understand his teachings. Otherwise, you will fail, not only the clan, but the entire world. The wolf is seen in a classroom environment taking a test of some sort. He turns it into a cloaked teacher and receives an F. The entire class points and laughs at him, then pulls out a plethora of medieval weaponry from their robes. They then proceed to close in on the wolf. The wolf swallows the lump in his throat before the video ends. Video 6 was Tasks and Rituals. As a new recruit, you'll be asked to carry out various tasks ranging from the mundane to the fantastic. Most of these missions will involve fetching ingredients for our rituals. As boring as they may sound, it is the most important thing you can ever do for the clan. Rituals are what give the clan power. Without this power, we cannot hope to rid the world of what plagues it. The wolf fails to bring ingredients to clan member for ritual. Jump cut to a wolf being sacrificed on a black altar atop a pentagram carved into the floor. He's beaten, cut open, and eventually torn apart by his fellow clansmen. Video 7 was about mortals. When accepted as a full-fledged clan member, you are no longer considered human. You'll be one of us. From that point forward, you are discouraged from any and all human interaction, unless it's deemed necessary to the cause. Humans are vile, filthy, disgusting, and dangerous creatures. We seek to exterminate them once and for all. Any human who knows of our existence and isn't deemed worthy enough to join must be killed. Nature is your only friend. The wolf is walking down a main street-like environment and can be seen waving to everyone he sees. He comes upon a clan member who then pierces his gump with a long blade and tosses him aside in the road where he is then run over by numerous cars. The content of the videos was incredibly jarring. I almost couldn't believe that such a cult could actually exist, let alone that Wallace would join them. He must have really been lonely. The last video exited with the same join the pack spiel and then faded out to a screen with a series of numbers. I assumed this was my invitation into the den, perhaps an encrypted set of coordinates leading to the clan's lair. That, I thought, must have been where Wallace had gone. 
Just as I was in the thick of things, something hit me. One of the videos stated that you couldn't talk to anyone about the clan under any circumstances. But Wallace had talked to Chuck. That didn't make any sense. Wallace was a stickler for rules. Another fact hit me. The video stated that you could only talk about clan activity with other clan members. What if Chuck was one of them? Chuck could be stationed at the college to recruit members, and he simply nudged Wallace in the right direction. He could have been playing dumb with me when I questioned him. So either Chuck was a clansman or Wallace broke a cardinal rule. Neither theory held much water. If Chuck was a member, then why would he have told me anything about either recruiting or killing me? And if Wallace was so eager to be accepted into a strict cult, then why would he disobey their wishes? I couldn't make much sense of either angle. I eventually gave in to the notion that perhaps Wallace simply disregarded the rules in lieu of his excitement. He was finally going to have friends, so he had to tell someone. This didn't completely sit well with me, but I had to get back to cracking the code. I didn't have time to dwell on the uncertainties. And just then, there was a knock at my dorm room door, followed by a voice. It's Chuck, the janitor. I'm here to tidy up your room. Chuck never cleaned dorm rooms. It wasn't part of his job. I'm all set. I yelled, hoping he would leave me be. The knocking ceased. There was a long stretch of silence, followed by a soft, metallic creak. The doorknob was turning. Something called Candleheart killed my brother. My brother is dead. As I sit looking into the tattered brown box that sits in my lap, I know that now. And while I know the thing called Candleheart is to blame, I still feel like it's really my fault. It was my suggestion that put us in its path in the first place. Two years ago, our father passed away. He was only 61 years old, but he'd had a bad heart for a number of years, so when I got the call that he had died in his sleep, it was terrible news, but not really a shock either. I'd gotten on a plane the next morning, and when I arrived, Michael picked me up from the airport. He was a good little brother, as little brothers go, and while he was 10 years younger than me at 24, we'd always gotten along well and remained friends even when I moved across country after college. We talked on the trip back to the house, alternating between catching up on the latest happenings in each other's lives and talking about our father. The rhythm continued over the next few days when we had time alone together, which wasn't much between helping our mother and dealing with friends and relatives. That rhythm continued over the next few days when we had time alone together, which wasn't much between helping our mother and dealing with friends and relatives. But after the funeral was done and the last of the mourners had left, our mother had announced she was going to go to sleep for a good long while, no doubt aided by the pills I had seen our Aunt Clara pressing into our mother's palm after the graveside service. So me and Michael decided to head into town and go get something to eat. It was while we were eating hot wings and reminiscing about our dad and the idea of taking a camping trip came up. Our father, who was no real outdoorsman, had always enjoyed camping for some reason, and when we were growing up, he would always try and get us out to go camping with him. In truth, we only went a few times over the years, but I still remember how happy it seemed to make him. Those camping trips seemed part of some idyllic familial fantasy to him, and no matter how much our mother protested the bugs or myself and Michael argued, he would always bring it up once or twice a year like a car salesman trying to entice us into another test drive. Looking back on it now, I admit to feeling some guilt that we hadn't gone more when he suggested it, and I know that guilt is part of what prompted me to ask Michael if he wanted to go camping that weekend. I expected him to laugh or make an excuse why we couldn't do it, but instead he started nodding right away. He still lived at home, and he said that a couple of days away from there, assuming Mom was doing okay, would suit him just fine. 
We started making plans, and when we got back to the house, we found enough camping gear in decent shape that our costs, aside from gas and food, would be minimal. So after talking it over with our mother and making sure she was good for the next few days, we headed out off to the next morning on our camping adventure. I had wanted to go to an established camping area with designated camping sites and a building that contained toilets and showers, but Michael convinced me that it wouldn't be in the spirit of things to half-ass it. We needed to go somewhere off the beaten track where we weren't surrounded by people and had to squat, take a dump. His argument was less than eloquent, but I got his point. We wanted it to be a trip our dad would think was really cool. So he found us a large state park covered by a forest about 100 miles away. After downloading maps and considering our options, we settled on a loose plan that involved parking on the west side of the park, hiking in about 10 miles to a smallish body of water called Winter's Lake, and then setting up camp. Day two would be hanging out, hiking around a bit more, and then heading back out. We got to the large gravel parking lot by 10 that morning, and after adding the food and water we had bought on the trip up to our backpacks, we headed east into the forest. Despite it being a bright and sunny day, parts of the forest were surprisingly dark, and the large hardwoods that loomed overhead blocking out much of the light as we traveled along what looked like some kind of pig path in a generally easterly direction. I had some concerns with us getting lost, but Michael did a surprisingly good job of keeping us on course, periodically checking the compass he had brought and calling out a couple of spots where he could see what looked like landmarks from the map. The past few days, seeing him help our mother and remain patient and kind with all the other mourners had helped me appreciate how much my brother had grown up. He could still be immature at times, and I know he still relied on me for some things because I was his big sister, but he had become a man, and a good one at that. I was thinking about that, and looking off into the trees when I ran into the back of him. He stumbled a step forward and then turned to look at me. Watch it, you gave me a flat tire. He shot a mock frown before grinning as he pointed. Look over there. I followed his finger and saw that 50 yards to our left, there was what looked to be the ruins of some old large house. It was surrounded by trees and bushes so thick that it was easy to overlook, and if we had been a bit further away, I doubt we would have seen it at all. I would have preferred that, because the place looks creepy. Looks like the start of a horror movie. I glanced at Michael, seeing the look on his face. No, sir. No way, we're not going to be the dumb bitches that go explore the abandoned house and get eaten by the hillbilly zombies that live there. We're going to be the smart bitches that keep moving and go eat s'mores. His frown was genuine now, but it looks badass. He pointed at it again as though to drive home his point. Look at how badass that is. I shook my head. You know what's not badass? The snake bites, falling through rotten floorboards, the aforementioned hillbilly zombies... Let's go. Fine. You suck. Robbed us of a really cool story and pictures, too. Hope you're proud of yourself. I nudged him forward. I think you'll survive. Another half hour and we're at Lake Winter. It was actually a bit larger than I thought it would be, and while calling it a lake was still somewhat grandiose, I had to admit that there was something striking about it. The shore was made up of small gray rocks we had not seen anywhere else in our walk here and the water itself was a placid, steely blue. Compared to the brownish-green ponds I was used to seeing growing up just a hundred miles south, it seemed almost like the rocks and water had been plucked from another continent, maybe one with Vikings. Turning to Michael, I gestured toward the lake. See? This is cool. He looked skeptical. Eh, it's alright, yeah. It's kind of weird. Do you think it was man-made? I shrugged. I guess it's possible, but it would cost a ton for something this size, and given that it's a state park, wouldn't there be some kind of sign-up or some marker saying who donated the money for it or something? Either way, let's get back up on the grass and set up the tents. My ass does not need eight hours of sleeping on those hard little rocks. We set up camp and got a fire going, and after taking a long walk around the oval perimeter of the lake, we settled into cooking hot dogs as twilight began to darken into night. While I was tired, I wasn't ready to go to sleep yet, and I was having to fight the urge to pull out my phone and start playing a game or watching a video. 
I heard Michael grunt and looked up from my plate to see he was already poking at his phone disconnectedly. I have like one bar. My browser has shit on itself and died twice. I scowl at him. Good. We're supposed to be out here camping and having family bonding time. He flicked me off and stuffed the phone back in his pocket. Okay, well, I gotta go take a piss, so don't do any bonding without me while I'm gone. With that, he jumped up and headed back off toward the trees. When I saw him continuing to go to the hundred yards or so to the edge of the forest, I thought about yelling that he didn't actually have to piss on the tree. Instead, I just shook my head and went back to eating my hot dog. About a minute later, I heard Michael yelling something to me. I looked up and saw him at the edge of the trees, shifting from the ball of one foot to another, as though trying to get a better look at something with his flashlight. I yelled back and asked what he said. Faintly, I heard him respond, I think I see something. A light or something? It's closer now than it was. For whatever reason, I felt my stomach go cold. Sitting down my plate, I stood up and walked a few steps from the campfire my eyes locked on Michael's barely illuminated form. Michael, come back from there. Come on, please. I saw him turn toward me, and then something made him turn back to the woods. I heard him yell, What the fuck? Oh, God, no, fuck! Started running toward me. I was going to ask what was wrong, but then I saw the figure stepping out of the brush. At that distance and in the dark, I couldn't make much out of it. The only light that touched it came from the partial moon glowing spectrally above the lake and some kind of flickering light on the shape itself. But from what I could tell, it looked like a large man, and my desire to encounter some large stranger in the middle of nighttime woods was less than zero. As Michael made his way closer to the firelight, I could see by his face that he was terrified. I was going to ask who it was or what was wrong, but he was already yelling again. We've got to go. Run. Leave everything and just run. He grabbed my arm and started pulling on me, but I resisted for a moment, wanting to understand. What? What is it? What's wrong? I glanced back at the approaching figure, and I could only make out slightly more detail. His feet seemed abnormally large and strange, and it looked as though he was wearing some kind of hood or cloak, and I could see something billowing behind them. But the oddest thing was the light he was holding. It was flickering like some kind of flame, and I guessed it must be a lantern of some sort, but in the dark it almost looked like it was part of him. Michael yanked my arm again. It's some kind of monster. I I don't know, but it looks fucking real. Let's go. This time he pulled enough to propel me forward, and I started running with him. I still had in the back of my mind it might be some kind of elaborate joke, whether Michael was in on it or not, but he looked scared enough that I wasn't taking any chances. We ran towards the woods, Michael moving his grip down my hand as we hit the brush at the edge of the clearing and kept going. I glanced back and saw the figure had changed course and was heading towards us, but at a measured, almost leisurely pace. Good, I thought. Please let him keep going slow. We ran a few more feet before Michael looked back and came to a stop. (sighs) He's gone. I looked around panting and saw that he was right. In the span of less than ten seconds, it had gone from walking towards us across the clearing to vanishing into thin air. That didn't do anything to make me less afraid. Keep moving, Michael. Let's get out of here. We started back running, trying to strike the right balance between speed and not breaking something in the dark. We only had the one flashlight between us, with mine having been left back in the tent near the lake. The blackness of the woods felt like a palpable thing, some kind of thick, cool liquid with weight and viscosity we had to push against as we made our way forward. Michael would periodically stop and glance at his compass, and both of us were constantly scanning our surroundings for any sign of an approaching shadow or the strange glow of firelight. We made the journey back to the car in a fraction of the time it had taken us to leave it, and when we stepped out into the gravel, I stopped to catch a few lungs worth of gasping breath. Still bent over, I started fumbling in my pocket for the keys when I heard Michael screaming. My head snapped up and I saw him trying to backpedal from the thing that had somehow pursued us across ten miles without being seen. At this distance, and with the parking lot illuminated by the pale moonlight, 
I could see the creature much better. It looked like a man, or at least the crude, monstrous approximation of one. It stood around seven feet tall, its head and torso partially covered by some kind of thin and rotting shroud. The skin underneath looked like some kind of dark stone or clay, and in the darkness with arms and legs of the same material, but bearing the appearance of hard, twisted appendages like the branches of some sinister-looking tree dwelling deep in the heart of a forgotten and decaying swamp. It reached one of those arms out and grasped Michael's arm in a clawed hand that turned his screams of terror into screeches of pain. He's biting me! He's biting me! I was already in motion to pull Michael free, but his words sunk in enough for me to find them strange. I could see a little of the thing's face, but I didn't see its mouth anywhere near my brother. I grabbed Michael's other arm and pulled, afraid it would do little good. To my surprise, I saw the monster let go as I tugged, and in the dim light, I saw something my mind didn't want to accept. The palm of the thing's hand was filled with a black void that dripped with my brother's blood. When I thought about it later, I realized I had also glimpsed silverly teeth retreating back into that oval hole in its hand. Small and sharp, I had saw the glittering of two rows in the moment before I turned away and pulled Michael with me toward the car. I expected to be caught at any moment, that horrible biting grass falling onto my shoulder or the back of my neck, but nothing came. We were inside the car and I turned the headlights on, and I could see that the creature was still standing where we had left it, silently staring at us. The lower half of its body was illuminated by the lights, showing thick legs that ended in something more akin to roots than any kind of feet. And above the line of cars' as lights, the fire flickered on. The monster wasn't holding a light. It was the light. In the right upper part of the thing's chest, where a heart would lay beating in a man, there was a hole over half a foot wide that went all the way through its body from front to back. In that hole, a large yellowish-brown candle burned brightly, illuminating whatever material made up the surrounding flesh and a portion of the tattered shroud that draped down the creature's back. I found myself growing transfixed by that flame, and it was a shove for Michael that woke me out of it. Nodding, I threw the car to drive and spun out of the parking lot. Michael was understandably hysterical, and I was too, though I tried to keep control for both of our sake. We debated going to a hospital, a hotel, or home. We both quickly rolled out home until we had some time to calm down and make sure we wouldn't be followed further. I pushed for the hospital, but Michael said that he wanted to get a room some ways away from the park and look at his arm before we made a decision on that. I thought about arguing further, but given his states, I relented. I drove another 30 minutes and then pulled in at a decent-looking motel. When we got into the room, I took him to the bathroom and we looked at his arm. I knew immediately we had made a mistake and he needed to go to the hospital. It looked like a small chunk had been ripped out of his arm. The edges of it ragged with small holes as though the thing had been biting and raking its teeth into his flesh trying to find a good purchase to tear apart free. The perimeter of the hole was also looking darker than it should with several sinister looking lines starting to push out from the wound itself. We have to get you to a doctor, now. He was already starting to shake his head and I stopped him. No, it's not a conversation. You could have an infection or be poisoned, and we'll be as safe or safer at a hospital than we are here. As the last words left me, I heard the front door of the room swing open. Leaning and looking out the bathroom door, I saw the thing standing in the doorway, the lights in the room showing me more of it than before. I let out a scream and shoved the bathroom door shut, keeping my weight against it, but I knew it wouldn't be any real barrier to that thing. I knew I had locked the room door and put the chain on, but it had somehow walked in like those locks didn't exist. I looked for a bathroom window, but there was none. I had time to look into Michael's terrified eyes and see that he knew what was out there before the door was flung open, and I was shoved out of the way and into the wall. Michael began to squeal like some kind of caught animal as the thing reached into the tiny room and grabbed him by the forearm, casually dragging him out despite my brother's desperate attempts to hold on to the sink and then the door frame. 
I got back up and launched myself past Michael and onto the creature's back. I tried to find purchase on it, digging my fingers into its flesh and finding it to be somewhat yielding, even as I gagged. The smell as I broke the surface of its skin was like that of rotten meat, and the texture of the material itself seemed to be some kind of hard wax. Pausing for a moment, its free arm bent backwards and grabbed me by the neck, pulling me from its back. It swung me around until I was facing it. I could distantly feel the hard rasp of teeth scraping the skin on the side of my neck eagerly without actually biting down, but my thoughts were preoccupied by its face. Any crude shapings or strange, blunt lines of its body did not carry over into that face. There was a well-shaped, long-curving nose over thick, betraken lips that tipped upward at the ends as it looked at me. Its eyes were some kind of glowing stone, almost like large fire opals, given some inner iridescence, flaring in time with the terrible sound it made deep in the black hollows of its throat. It was chuckling at me. I was barely able to breathe, but I was going to try and plead for my brother and myself, despite the cruelty and malignant pleasure I saw etched across its features. But then it flung me aside, sending me crashing through the front window of the room a moment before dragging Michael out the door. For a few seconds, my world flashes in noise and pain. I knew I needed to pull myself together to try again, but I couldn't make my body work right. Rolling over on my side, I saw the thing pulling Michael with him, the keening animal wail having dwindled to a defeated muffled groan. As I watched, I saw the thing in Michael sinking into the earth as they proceeded forward, almost as though they were walking into the tide of some earth and sea. I let out a scream and I saw Michael reach out his hand to me feebly for a moment before they both disappeared into the ground. I lay on the concrete outside the room, broken and bleeding for some time before anyone came out and called 911. I went to the hospital, and the next day I had to tell my hysterical mother that I had somehow lost her son. I tried to tell people the truth of what happened, but they looked at me sympathetically and talked about head trauma and shock. So then I told a more palatable version of a man attacking us at our campsite and then the motel and that some level of search parties and investigation, but of course, nothing was ever found. Two years have passed since that time, and despite my own efforts, I never found my brother. I've been back to those woods a dozen times, but things are never as they were on that trip we took. I never see the ruins of that old house, and Winter Lake is a small, yellowed pond, not what we camped on near the night Michael was taken. And I've never seen Candleheart again. I know he's called Candleheart by some because of the research I've done. There are very few references, even in the darker and more eccentric corners of the internet, but I found a forum post that described the legend of a monster with mouths on its hands that abducted and sacrificed people comments were rife with more random speculation and odd tales about rituals and what motives of the monster really were, but no one had anything verifiable or frankly credible sounding. But there was one brief reply that caught my attention. Its name is Candleheart. It feeds the dark things of the earth for its own profit and waits for winter's return. I tried to contact the poster, but I never received any response, and while the name Candleheart makes sense, I've never found another reference to it in relation to the monster. After a year of trying, I'm ashamed to say I gave up. It was too hard to keep living every day, reliving what had happened to Michael, looking for some clue or sign that might help him, lying to myself more as time passed about the odds that he could be okay or even alive. Within the last couple of months, life has started to feel less terrible. Not like it used to be, but somewhat better. Therapy for me and mom has helped, but most of it has been time. I realized last week I had gone an entire day without thinking about Michael, and it made me both relieved and terribly sad. And then this morning, I opened my door to go to work and found the box. It was of thick, high-quality cardboard, though it was ragged in spots and had several stains along the top. 
a little larger than a cake box. It was tied with a rough twine string that I had to saw at to cut with a kitchen knife. There was no writing or label, so I was slightly leery of opening it at all, but my curiosity and growing dread told me I had to know what was inside. When I took off the top and looked inside, I stopped breathing. The box contained Michael's face. Not his literal face, but a yellowish mask of it. A death mask. My skin crawling, I reached out and touched its surface, already knowing what I'd feel. It was made of wax. And my god... It was screaming. Comprehensive Video Review I work at a security counseling firm that specializes in working with corporate and local government contractors to evaluate their security needs and advise any changes that should be implemented to their network, surveillance devices, and personnel. It may sound boring, and that's because it usually is. Occasionally we get interesting problems that need solving, but usually we're just coming in to correct things after there's been some incident that became an expensive headache for whoever owns the property. In other words, we're there to stop the next lawsuit. The thing that piqued my interest about the Murphy Park assignment was that there hadn't been any recent incidents that my company was aware of. And looking at the initial survey packet, it appeared that their camera systems, while old, were surprisingly comprehensive. Hell, 20 years earlier, they would have been state-of-the-art. And while the image quality no doubt needed an upgrade, they had already fully converted to an NAS drive with cloud backup five years ago. That's when I reached the last page of our packet, which is essentially our work order sheet telling us what the client wants done. I expected to see a camera upgrade or possibly an overall evaluation of their security staff, but it was neither. Instead, it said, Comprehensive video review. This is one of our least requested services, both because it's rarely needed and because it's so time consuming and consequently expensive. The client identifies a period of time and what activity they are targeting and then we go through everything within those parameters. This could be hours or even days or weeks worth of video and typically it only gets used when someone is suspected of stealing from their company and forensic analysis of their work computer isn't getting the job done. It's mind-numbingly boring work, but we get a 10% commission on top of our salaried pay for jobs that take longer than a week and require us to be away from home. This job was well over the state line, and... But that couldn't be right. I read it again. Sure, I had made a mistake the first time. But no. It said that the video review was to be conducted from September 1st, 1998 forward. Over 20 years of video. Had they kept it all? That seemed extremely unlikely, especially given the storage considerations of the pre-digital videos. And how could one person possibly go through all that? Even if I got a five-man crew, which was never going to happen, and we scrubbed at high speed, skimming for just the high-activity hotspots, it would take months to go through that much footage, even one camera. And according to the survey packet, Murphy Park had 28. I asked my boss if this was a joke. He just shrugged, said the client probably didn't know what they were asking for, and that I should go check it out to see what they really needed and give them an estimate. Just to make sure, he added, that they understood it was going to be expensive. Money is not of consequence in this matter. We understand the logistics of the undertaking and are prepared to render whatever fees you feel are appropriate. I rubbed my chin, searching for the right words. I wanted to be clear without sounding condescending. This man, Mr. Jenkins, seemed to be perfectly intelligent, but I had to believe he didn't really appreciate what he was asking for. Ah, um, well, that's fine, but just logistically, how many cameras are we talking about? The man had a slender frame and a long, mousy face that twitched in surprise at my question. 
cameras. Oh, no. Just the one for your company. We've contracted with other organizations for the rest, and we'd like you to focus your efforts on the primary camera covering the northern promenade. I nodded. That was more reasonable, but still. And you really want me to review all the way back to 1998? His nose twitched again. Yes, yes, it's critical that we have everything reviewed going back to the opening of the park on September 1st, 1998. It's all organized and archived, and we can have people bring you the videos as you request them. Jenkins paused, his eyes wide as he searched my face with what's something akin to nervousness. Is that going to be a problem? I let out a short laugh before I could catch myself. (laughs) A problem? No, not really. I mean... I can do the job, but you have to understand that we're talking over 8,700 hours being recorded just for one year, and this is over 21 years worth of footage. I have software that can help with some of the newer footage, but the older stuff? Even scrubbing through it as fast as I can, it would likely take me two to three weeks to make it through a year. At two weeks a year, you're talking around 10 or 11 months for me to finish everything. That's a rough estimate, but you'd be looking at a cost north of $100,000, plus expensives, before we're done. I gave the man an apologetic smile. So, if you can narrow it down some, we can talk about some options that are more... That price sounds perfectly reasonable. We can pay half the money up front, if you wish. I blinked. Uh, I... What? You're going to pay that kind of money? Just like that? The man glanced away for a moment, his expression growing, worried as his skin paled. Looking back at me, he nodded. Certainly. Tell me the amount required and it will be sent to your company today. That was on January 3rd, 2019. By January 5th, I was sent up in a new extended stay lodge on the outskirt of Jessica's Resolve, a strangely named little town 20 miles north of Empire, a larger town that held Murphy Park at its center. Our company's travel coordinator had asked if I didn't want to stay at one of the places in Empire. They were closer to the work site and looked nicer as well, at least online. But I held firm to my request for lodging out of town. Something about that place, not just the park, but the entire town, it just didn't sit right with me. From the first time I'd met Mr. Jenkins at the park admin's office, I'd had the sense of someone watching me. I tried to chalk it up to the cameras, but somehow that didn't feel true. I'd spent far too much time in this job to get spooked just because there was a camera on me. No, it was something unique to Empire, a peculiar weight that would always lift a few miles out of town. I felt that weight on me in those first few days and weeks, and if I'm honest, it's not something I've ever gotten used to. My days were largely mundane, and during my limited interactions with people who worked in the town or at the park, everyone acted friendly enough. But despite that, I still found myself always rushing toward the city limits when I got to head back home to JR and my home away from home. The work itself was largely tedious as it sounds. To the park's credit, they really had preserved all the footage and had all the legacy equipment I needed to review the older stuff, but it still meant fast-forwarding through endless footage, all showing the same 70-yard stretch of grass cut through by a wide, paved walkway. There were trees along the promenade and in the distance, and the periodic benches of wrought iron and wood gave weary travelers a place to rest a while. All in all, it seemed like a nice and well-maintained park, though it was typically fairly empty except for one of the weekends and during the summer months. For most of the part, I sat there watching a scene that could have been a still shot if not for the shifting of the sun and the occasional introduction of a bird or squirrel into the boundaries of the camera's frame. With no guidance or direction other than keep an eye out for anything of note, I found myself looking down at the barrel of the longest, most boring assignment of my career. That 10k commission bonus was a big incentive, but damn, was I dreading all these hours of watching nothing happening. And then I started watching October of 1998. That was the first time that things started to change. October 30th, 1998. At approximately 2051, a figure wearing a skeleton costume comes into view on the right side of the frame. He is running along the promenade and continues to look backward. A few seconds later, a second very similar figure comes into view. 
Like, like the first one, this one is dressed in a skeleton costume and is running, though it appears he is chasing the first individual. As the first person leaves the frame on the left, the one on the right leaps forward to close the distance. It must be the angle of the camera because this looked like an impossible jump unless he was training for the Olympics. The second figure continues to run upon landing and neither of the subjects are seen again. October 24th, 2001. At 1440, a bike messenger comes into view. He breaks on the middle bench in the frame and gets off his bike. Taking what appears to be a small black envelope from his bag, he sticks it under the bench. After glancing around for a moment, he gets back on his bike and paddles out of view. October 27th, 2005. Around midnight, a hulking figure lumbers into the left side of the frame. Despite the size, long, black hair frames a face that is distinctly feminine, though for the most part the rest of her form is indistinct. This is because her clothes are baggy and torn, looking more like a collection of rags than anything else. The peculiar distinction to all this is that her back, which appears to be humped to a crest equal to the top of her head, is covered in a crochet doily of bright white like my grandmother used to bring out at Easter. This is all strange enough, but after a moment, the cause of her lumbering gait becomes clear. She's dragging a small coffin, possibly a child's coffin, by its end handle, through the grass behind the benches. It is the same brilliant white as the doily, and while it appears to be very heavy, the woman makes good progress and is soon gone. About 2.18, a badly injured man stumbles toward the benches from the tree line far in the distance. He collapses at the edge of the promenade, blood from several wounds trickling out onto the white stones of the walk. Thirty minutes pass, and then you see the flash of lights as paramedics come into view and check him before carrying him away on a bodyboard. As he opens it, the two lamps on either side of his position flicker and then go out. After a moment, the one on his right comes back, followed by the one on the left. As this happens, however, another farther down goes out, as though the darkness traces the path of something unseen. October 27th, 2017 For two hours on this day, and the two that follow, an old stooped woman with bandages wrapping her feet and legs sits on the same bench. A crooked cigarette dangles from her mouth as she talks incessantly, dancing with the rhythm of her silent words. But while I can't hear what she was saying, it's clear that she thinks she's talking to someone, even though the park around her is empty. And on the third day, when she jumps to her feet and appears to begin calling out, cupping her yellowed fingered hands around her mouth as she moves out of the camera's gaze, I know that at least in her own mind, her phantom companion has abandoned her. October 29th, 2018. Around 2200 hours, a heavyset middle-aged woman limps up toward one of the benches. Her clothes are dirty, and as she looks around in every direction, I feel a flush of sympathy for her. There's a desperation to her that reminds me of a wounded animal that's being hunted. Even though I know that this happened months earlier, I still find myself wishing I could help her. That's when she takes a final look around, then bites out of her right wrist. The blood comes immediately, and as she falls to her knees, she immediately begins scrawling something across the white stones of the walk. I can't make all of it out. The image is fuzzy, and she's blocking part of it with her body as she works but I see what looks like the professor is. And then for the first time in all those months, the camera goes down. When the image comes back, an hour has passed, and both the woman and the crimson message she was writing are gone. I've often considered asking about these strange incidents, but I always resist the temptation. That's not my job. I'm not here to investigate or question my client. I'm here to record and report. Still, over the past 10 months, I've only felt my unease grow. It's not just the work or the strange things I've sometimes seen in doing it. It's this park, this town. There's something wrong with this place. I've considered asking for a transfer, but I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Even with the footage that's occurred during my time here, I keep telling myself I should be caught up to present within a matter of weeks. Yesterday, I came into the park security office to find a new hard drive. I assumed it was the June and July 2019 footage I'd asked for the day before, but when I plugged it in, I found only one file inside. It was video footage dated November 30th, 2019. 
At first, I figured it was just a mistake on the timestamp. I'd always been impressed with how accurate and consistent their system was, but nothing was foolproof. But then I saw what, or rather who, was in the video. I came from the bottom of the frame, staggering toward the nearest bench and falling down onto it. I sat back up after a moment, and I could see from the camera's vantage that this other me had dark stains like mud or blood all over his hands and sleeves. As I watched, I ran my hands through my hair, causing clumped spikes of hair to stand out from my head and only making me look more insane. Because my expression... I didn't look right at all. As the other me lowered his head, I saw his shoulder shaking. At first, I thought it was for laughter, but then I saw he was crying. Harder and harder until his whole body shook. When he lifted his head again, he stared straight into the camera, stared straight into me and began to scream. I pushed back from the monitor, almost as though I was afraid that the other self might find a way to come out of the video and into my more sane version of the world. But when I edged closer and looked again, he lost interest in me. Instead, he was looking down at himself, appearing to scream even harder. It was understandable. He was being erased, after all. As I watched, he slowly started fading away, the fighting and thrashing doing nothing to slow his erasure from the world. There was a final ghost of movement, and then he was gone, as though he'd never been there. As though I had never been there. I'm writing this so there is a record. I've tried to leave the area over 20 times in the last day, but I always somehow wind up back at the park or in my room. I've tried calling people I know, asking for help, but they don't seem to understand. They just say it was good hearing from me and then they hang up. I'll try sending this account to people or maybe posting it online somewhere. It'd be logical to think that this won't go through either, but somehow I think it will. Because it's all a trap, you see. <laughs> There's something in this place. Something lured me here, showed me all these things, and now it won't let me go. I think it wants me to tell what I've seen, so I warn you now. Don't investigate this. Don't try to find me or the things I've seen. This story is dangerous, and as I write it, I understand I should destroy it, erase it, the way I saw myself get wiped out of the world, but somehow, I don't think it will. That's part of the trap, too. It's a simple trap, but it's clever. It relies on our own mistakes. Mine were in thinking I was safe, removed from the things I was seeing, the world I was visiting, and yours, well, I think you've made at least two. You probably think you found a made-up story, something to entertain you or at least kill a little time. That's your first mistake. This is all real. It's happening to me right now. I'm trapped in this place and every day I get closer to that park bench in my end. As for your second mistake... It's easy. You think you found the story, but you're wrong. It found you. Something was in the trees. Nine years ago, I had a car accident. It was around October 16th or 17th in 2010. Whatever, it was late at night on a Sunday, I remember that much. Because as I drove down the winding dark road that would take me past Empire and the handful of smaller towns that lay between me and my bed, I was talking to myself, saying how stupid I had been to come all this way for Jeffrey's Halloween party, especially when I had work the next day. My cousin Jeffrey is a good guy and he's always been a good friend to me, but he's also always had it easy. His part of the family is wealthy and his idea of work is telecommunicating from home a couple days a week while goofing off the rest of the time. He doesn't live in the real world, and so when he wants to throw an elaborate Halloween party, he not only does it in the middle of the month, but he does it on a Sunday, when we should know a lot of people he invites are going to have to drive a long way. Because Jeffrey lives in Jessica's Resolve, a little town in the middle of nowhere, I'm sure he's a rock star 
out there with his money and his parties and his revolving door, beautiful girlfriends. But out in the real world, you have to work for things. Stuff isn't just handed to you. You have to take it. But if I'm honest, I've always been a bit jealous of Jeffrey. He's never bragged about his money, and I've never seen him be shitty to anyone. But that hadn't stopped me from finding reasons to resent him or find fault with whatever he did. And of course, I didn't have to go to the party in the first place. I went because, for at least a little while, I got to pretend I was part of that brighter, prettier world. I left that world once. I pulled out of his long driveway well past midnight. The roads were all black and coiled, and my limited familiarity with the area wasn't much help on that dark and cloudy night. The worst part was how tired I was. It had been a busy weekend, and I'd stayed longer than I'd intended, talking to a girl Jeffrey introduced me to. At the time, it seemed very important, but now I can't even picture her face. So I talked to myself to stay awake. I started off monologuing about the woman I'd met, but as I got sleepier and more resentful of how far I'd let it go, I shifted to talking about how dumb I was to have stayed so late. How inconsiderate Jeffrey was to throw his party on a Sunday. How tired I was going to be the next day when I finally made it home. And then I woke up as I was plunging off the road, the back of the car seeming to float for a moment before slamming back down at the gravel shoulder and picking up speed, pulling me further down the embankment and into the darkness of the trees waiting below. There was no time to stop or change course, and I barely managed to close my eyes as the world around me exploded. Glass, metal, and wood collided and protested as the front of the car slammed into one of the wide tree trunks at the bottom of the hill. I felt a band of fire flare across my chest as my seatbelt held me in place, but for whatever reason, the airbag never deployed. I tried to slow my head's forward momentum, but my forehead still struck the wheel with enough force to split the skin and send a thin ribbon of blood down into my eyes as I sat back and began trying to look around. A large tree branch stretched out next to me, impaling my empty passenger seat and making my stomach loosen as I realized how close I'd come to dying. Instead, I was surprisingly okay. My chest and head hurt some, and I was very shook up a bit and woozy, but all things considered, I didn't think I had any lethal energy. Blah, 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 blah. My chest and head hurt some, and I was very shook up and a bit woozy, but all things considered, I didn't think I had any lethal injuries. I couldn't get to my driver's side door to open, so I clumsily climbed out the other side. I intended to just walk away, but my knees began to buckle as soon as I stepped out of the car. Catching myself, I crawled some distance away before stopping to rest and check my phone. It was dead. I had meant to plug it up when I started driving, but I guess I was tired and just forgot. Either way, it was looking like I'd have to make my way up the road and just try and flag down the next car that came by. Despite being near the outskirts of Empire, I didn't remember seeing many cars on the road before the crash, so I might be waiting a while. It's as I got unsteadily back to my feet that I noticed an orange glow in the distance. Not in the direction of the road, but deeper into the woods. I didn't like the idea of venturing further into the dark with thoughts of snakes and other wild animals crowding for position in my mind. But it looked like firelight. Maybe someone was camping and had a bonfire nearby. If so, I might find help a lot sooner than waiting by the road. So I stumbled forward, and yes, it was clearly some kind of firelight. It was a bit farther away than I had first thought, and between my unsteadiness and the uneven ground, I was making very slow progress, but I was getting closer. After what felt like hours, but was probably just a few minutes, I had made my way into the center of a large oval ring of giant oak trees and found the source of the flickering light. It was a small torch, set just below one of the oaks. At first, I was more focused at looking around the clearing itself, There were no people there, or signs of them for that matter. The ground was largely scraggly grass and bare earth that didn't have the appearance of possibly having been traveled or walked on recently, though I couldn't have said by what. All I knew was that in the orange circle of light the torch provided, 
I could see various scrapes and cuts in the earth as though something had been done there, and not too long before. I wanted to explore more, but I was nervous about venturing past my newly found sanctuary of torchlight, so instead I turned back to the tree itself. There'd been something there, right? I'd only half noticed it in my eagerness to look for people in the clearing, but... Yeah. Someone had nailed something, or some things, to the tree just above the height of the nearby torch. They were diamonds, or uh, diamond-shaped pieces of meat. There were seven of them, all roughly two inches tall and one inch wide, and they were all attached to the tree in two haphazard rows by... It wasn't nails. I reached out my finger to the end of one of the long needles that protruded from the top of each diamond of flesh. I barely touched it. But I immediately brought my hand back with a hiss of pain. When I looked, I had a pinprick of blood on the pad of my index finger. They weren't nails or needles. They were hairs. No, not hairs, really. More like quills or something, I guess. Whatever they were, they were razor sharp. I felt my unease growing into fear. I didn't know what was going on, but I could feel a panicked need to run away beginning to blossom in my chest. Trying to fight it back, I looked at the things hanging on the tree again. They were clearly cut out of something's skin, and it had been done with precision. The clean lines and sharp angles reminded me of the diamonds you see on old playing cards. They also looked to be largely different from each other in color and texture, but I still had no idea what they really were, and I didn't need to abandon the possibility of getting help just because I was spooked. I thought I'd seen a shadowed shape between the trees on the other side of the clearing. Maybe it was a tent or some other sign of people. For all I knew, someone could be asleep over there. I just needed to be quiet and get a bit closer, get a better look. When the night's half-moon still buried in the clouds, I decided I would have to borrow the torch. It took some effort, but I managed to wrench it from the ground after several tries. And holding it out in front of me for light and protection, I started toward the far end of the tree ring. When the light hit the thing hanging between the two of the trees there, it took several moments before my mind could fully register what I was seeing. I kept wanting to make it into something that made sense, something that wasn't horrific, and so I kept staring at it, gasping like a dying fish, wanting it to not be as bad as it was. It was a man, or the remains of one. His head had been removed, as had most of his organs. What was left, the skin, muscle, and bone, was tied at the wrists and ankles to the two supporting trees hung there like a dead animal waiting for the butcher. Just then, I heard a sharp rustling noise nearby. I looked around before realizing it wasn't behind me or to either side. It was above me. The flame from the torch wavered as my hands began to shake, but I held onto it as best I could as I raised my gaze to the trees above. The peaks of these oaks were over 60 feet in the air, far above how high my meager firelight would do. But still... In the near black dark of the treetops, I thought I sensed something. Something large was perched up there watching me, deciding what to do. It was as I was still peering up in the darkness that the rustling sound came again, briefly, this time louder, and as if on cue, the thick clouds obscuring the moon began to part. It... It stretched between three or four of the trees. It made me think of a centipede, or a thick snake, though I saw several long arms or legs along its length, even from such a distance. It was obvious it was massive, and I remember wondering how the trees could possibly support something that large on their upper branches. That, and all the other thought, fled from me when it began to move slightly, and the rustling began again. It was the thing's quills. I couldn't make them out until they were moving, but all along its back were long, quivering lines that I felt sure matched the dark needles embedded in the nearby tree. The noise, particularly after seeing its source, sent off something primal in my heart. 
the same kind of instinctual fear I had always felt hearing a rattlesnake's rattle or a mountain lion's scream. The bone-deep warming that said, Danger. Stop. Get away. I threw down the torch and began to run blindly, not caring where I was going so much that it was away from whatever that thing might be. I remember running some distance, and then... The next thing I recall is being loaded on a bodyboard back into the back of an ambulance. A woman, I think, one of the EMTs, telling me that I was alright to just calm down. That they were going to take me to Empire General Hospital. I was going to be fine. I was. At least for the most part. I spent the next five days in the hospital as they treated me for a concussion, a bruised kidney, two sprained wrists, and one fractured ankle, and various cuts and bruises. Three different times, doctors and nurses came and asked me what I remembered of what happened, and each time I told them that I didn't remember much of anything after the accident. It was a lie, of course, but I couldn't bring myself to tell them the truth. The one reason for that, of course, was because they would have thought I was either crazy or out of it because of my concussion, and either way, it wouldn't have helped anything. But the other reason was because I knew why they kept asking, why they were so curious about what I'd gone through that night. They wanted to know how. Out of all my understandable cuts and bruises, sprains and break, I had also managed to get one very unique and specific wound on the side of my stomach just above the belly button. A quarter inch deep with clean, straight lines. It didn't look like it came from a random gouge of glass or metal or wood. Even now, all these years later, the hollow of shallow scar tissue has retained its shape. The shape of a diamond, like you might find on an old playing card, or hanging from a tree in the darkest part of the woods. Between the Rows this is really lame. I shot Allison an irritated look. She seemed to ignore it as she stared past me at the signs plastered around the ticket booth for Jefferson Farm Corn Maze. My sister was always a naysayer when it came to stuff like this, but her comment was still tactless, even for her. It was Jenny's idea after all, the first suggestion or sign of enthusiasm she had since she'd come to live with us a month earlier. If Allison kept shitting on her idea, she might retreat back into her shell for good this time. Turning to Jenny, I smiled. You have to forgive Allison. She was born with a handicap, you understand. It's called being a fucking bitch. Jenny's eyes twinkled with surprise and merriment as she looked up at me, and she let out a little laugh when Allison punched me in the arm. No, I get it, Jenny said more seriously. It might be kind of lame, but it looked fun on the internet, and I thought we could have a good time. Get into the Halloween spirit a bit. Allison interrupted her. You're right, it'll probably be fun. She looked around with a sigh. Sorry, not to be a downer. Tell you what, you two get your tickets and I'll get us drinks. I followed her gaze and saw a large food truck set up serving soft drinks and beers, while another nearby truck sold funnel cakes and popcorn. She was eyeing the guy selling beers with interest, and I had to concede that he looked just greasy enough to be her type. Shrugging, I gave her a nod and turned with Jenny toward the ticket line. I had never known our cousin Jenny very well. She was the only child of our mother's brother and they lived on the other side of the state from us, though it wasn't so far in distance that it explained how rarely we ever saw them. The truth was that her family had always been fairly isolated. They would come around at Christmas time or Thanksgiving, maybe once every three or four years, but even then they didn't talk a lot or stay very long. They were never rude or weird acting, just kind of quiet. Uncomfortable looking or like they felt out of the loop because they weren't around more. I felt a bit sorry for them growing up, but I still always enjoyed their visits because of Jenny. Jenny was a lot more outgoing than her parents, and even though she was a girl, I always clicked with her a lot more than Allison did. Maybe it was because Allison was older. She was worried about what she was going to do when she graduated college next spring while me and Jenny were just getting into our last year of high school. Or maybe it was that their personalities didn't mesh well. 
Either way, over the years, I had been guilty more than once of wishing that I could swap out Allison for Jenny on a permanent basis. Jenny poked me in the side. Do you want to do any of the other stuff or just the corn maze? We were getting close to the front of the line, and her question prompted me to look at the menu of options hanging above the ticket booth window. There was a corn maze, a smaller, haunted corn maze, and a hayride. I weighed the money as well as Allison's patience in my head. Hmm, it's already past nine, and the corn maze looks huge. You cool with just doing that? I imagine it'll take a while. I let off the rest of my thought that Jenny didn't need to be exposed to whatever fake blood and violence would be waiting for us in the haunted maze. She seemed to consider it for a moment before nodding. Yeah, that sounds good. How about we'll be in the corn maze for a long time anyway? The night we found out Jenny was coming to live with us was a Saturday just like this one. I had planned on staying in and watching TV that night, and Allison was home for the weekend to see some guy she was dating. Or at least, one of the guys she was dating. While we hadn't talked about it directly, I had the distinct impression that she had a boyfriend at college, too, and that most likely neither guy knew about the other. Not that I cared. If someone was dumb enough to date her in the first place, I had very little sympathy to spare. I remember our parents coming home from shopping and being strangely quiet. They'd called us into the kitchen, our mother looking like she was in shock, her eyes red but not teary, our father rubbing her back with one hand while distractedly pulling at his mustache with the other. After a few moments of tense silence, our father started to explain. There had been some kind of incident at Jenny's house. A home invasion, possibly, though no one could say for sure. All that was certain was that she had come home the night before from a football game to find that her parents were both gone, and that there was blood all over the living room. At this point, our father had made a point of explaining that Jenny had two friends with her when she discovered they were gone, and that she had been at the football game for hours before that. As though we needed some reassurance, she wasn't the one who had hurt her own parents. I felt mildly irritated and offended by the suggestion. Jenny was one of the nicest and gentlest people I'd known, and even in my limited time with her over the years, I knew she loved her parents very much. The idea of her hurting them or somehow being tied to their disappearance? Well, it was just absurd. Still, I pushed down my frustration at my father's delivery of the terrible news and tried to listen. So far, there was no sign of them. Their phones and cars, wallets and keys, all those things had been left behind. After a few hours of investigation at child services determining she was going to have to be placed with a relative because she was still 17, our parents had gotten the call. Until her parents were found alive, however unlikely that might be, or she turned 18, she needed a place to stay, and we were her only relatives. For the first time, I felt a thrill of excitement at the idea of having Jenny around. I had always wanted to be closer with my big sister, but we were very different from each other, and as we had gotten older, those differences seemed to multiply. I loved Allison, but I didn't think I liked her that much, and I certainly couldn't say we were very good friends. Jenny, on the other hand, was awesome. We had similar interests, and she didn't respond to everything with sarcasm, or like she was defending against some kind of attack. Just the opposite. She was calm, laid back, and with an enthusiasm and sweetness that made you feel better just being around her. By the time Allison got back with our drinks, I was over my earlier anger and back to having a good time. Allison seemed in a better mood too, leading us to the long line to get into the corn maze without any of her usual eye-rolling or complaints. Jenny handed out small maps to each of us. Looking at the small square of paper, I saw with a surprise... It was a rough drawing of the corn maze itself. I held it up to Jenny. Isn't this kind of cheating? She grinned. Nah, not really. It helps some, but once you're in there, everything looks the same. I usually find the map messes me up more than it helps, but we've got it if you want to use it at least. Allison was still studying it when she asked, So have you done these mazes before? Jenny nodded. Yeah, me and my... My, my family used to do them almost every year, a tradition, I guess. Her expression grew sad for a moment before brightening again. But the maze is different every year, and if you come back to the same place, the only advantage I have is some experience. Allison raised an eyebrow at her. 
corn maze experience. <laughs> Is that a thing? Our cousin grinned and gave a shrug as we moved up the line. It's more useful than you may think. There were a surprising number of people at the Jefferson Farm corn maze. Kids strung out on sugar, running to get on the hayride as they were chased by beleaguered parents. Clusters of squealing teenagers running out of the haunted maze to the repetitive, whining roar of a chainless chainsaw. And in our own line, a mixture of young and old waiting for their turn to enter the giant corn maze. As far as we could tell, they were letting in groups of four or five people every couple of minutes. I guess the idea was that you would get a fairly even number of people coming in and going from the maze by staggering people's entry. While this may have worked wonders for the isolated ambience inside the maze itself, on the outside, they kind of sucked. We edged our way forward, but after over 40 minutes, we still hadn't made it to the front of the line. Jenny had actually made a supply run at the 20 minute mark, bringing us fresh drinks and a funnel cake. Then, when we were 10 people from entering, a man who seemed to work there came up to the gatekeeper of the maze, telling him it was time to cut the line for the night. The gatekeeper, a boy who looked only a couple of years older than me, cupped his hands around his mouth and yelled to the line of 70 or 80 people that the maze was going to have to be closed to new entries after three more groups. If someone was further back in the line than that, they could go to the ticket booth and get a new ticket for any other night in October. I understood the logic. The maze had to close at some time after all, but I still found myself anxiously wondering if we would make the cut. I knew it meant a lot to Jenny, and the odds of wrangling Allison to come out a second time this month were slim to none. To my relief, the gatekeeper walked past us and cut the line right behind me where we were standing. A few of the people muttered as they shuffled off, but then we were being ushered into the maze as one big final group and the noises and lights from the outside world faded away between the rows of corn that surrounded us on every side. The corn maze felt eerily separate from the place we had just left. The corn dampened sound and light, and with no light set up within the maze itself, everything had a fuzzy blue-black quality to it. The half-moon overhead and the ambient light from the rest of the attractions and booths provided just enough illumination to make out the dirt path as we walked forward, a faintly visible ribbon of dirt that wound and crisscrossed the further we went into the maze. We had no flashlights, but instead took turns using our phones as flashlight setting to provide some additional light. In some ways, it only made things more disorienting. The small circle of bright white light would make its best feeble effort to cut through the murk but it also made the surrounding dark seem that much darker. After a few minutes, we gave up on using our lights unless we were checking the map for some sign of where we actually were. The thing with the corn maze is that, like Jenny had said, everything looks the same. You're surrounded by 12-foot high stalks on every side, so tightly planted that you can't see more than a foot into the rows, much less the path that is 10 feet away on the other side. And the corn all looks the same. You try to find distinct curves or intersections, things that are unique enough that you can find their twin on a small map and get a bead on your location. Then you realize that the map is not entirely accurate and that there are several places on it that could be your special spot. So do you pick one up and try to use the map? You can, but that only works if you know where you're starting from. Do you ignore the map and just keep going? It's an option, but it's also a good way to wander for hours. We'd been in there for over 30 minutes, and with no real discernible progress towards the exit when Jenny asked a question. I wonder if you could stay in here after they're closed for the night. At first, I misunderstood what she meant. I thought she was worried that we might get stuck in here overnight, and I was quick to assure her that we could always just push through the corner, bearing that yell until someone found us as they undoubtedly would have people checking for stragglers before calling it a night. But Jenny shook her head. No, I mean, if we wanted to stay in after it was closed, just to explore and say we did it, could we get away with it? I expected Allison to have some smart comment at the suggestion, but she surprised me by showing interest. You know, I bet we could. Even if they send people through to get people out that are lost or don't want to leave, they can't find everybody, particularly if you don't want to be found. If we hid in the corn deep enough and stayed quiet, 
I bet they never know it. Then we could do whatever we wanted and leave when we got ready. I hated to be the wet blanket, but the idea sounded really boring and dumb to me. Plus, if I'm being honest, I'm not much for breaking the rules. Aside from any far-flung fears of the police being called if we were found lingering after hours or they noticed our car had never left the lot, just the embarrassment of being yelled at and escorted off the farm by the staff made my stomach squirm. Still, I didn't want to appear uncool or unfun, so I tried to look casual as I shrugged. Even if we could, what would be the point? We got in here after 10, and it's close to 11 now. We have to figure that they're going to let people stay until at least 11.30 or 12, right? Otherwise, people would get pissed for not getting along in the maze. So we're talking about killing time for an hour or more than just hiding in the corn for, what, another hour? Just so we can walk around the same maze we just walked around now? I saw Jenny's disappointed expression and tried to soften my words. I mean, we can, if you want. I just don't know that we'll have fun. I could hear the insincerity in my voice and hoped I was the only one. You suck. I bet you graduated first to the academy. Allison was frowning on me. I raised an eyebrow. Academy? She gave me a toothy smile. The fun police academy, you little bitch. She turned to Jenny. Ignore him. He's all butthurt if he doesn't return a library book on time. Plus, he checks out library books, so his vote doesn't count. And if you're down, I'm down. I felt anger and embarrassment tightening in my chest, but I couldn't think of any reply that wouldn't make me look worse. Besides, Jenny was already nodding excitedly and looking back to me. Are you cool with it, Kyle? I smiled weakly. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm probably wrong, and it'll be really fun. However, I couldn't help but add, and if we get bored, we can always change our minds. We started back walking through the maze, and occasionally I would see a glimpse of flashlight through the rows or hear someone talking or laughing some distance away, but we didn't run into anyone else despite the massive amount of people that had been led before us. At 11, an announcement went out over a hidden set of speakers somewhere. The car maze is now closed. Please exit the maze immediately. Thank you for coming. If you can't find your way out, yell and we will come find you. Allison poked me in the ribs and waggled her eyebrows. See, scaredy cat? Not so long away after all. Glancing back at Jenny, she grinned. Let's find a good hiding spot. We walked for a couple more minutes before finding a secluded corner that seemed to be especially dense with corn stalks. One concern that if you went deep in on one side, you may be visible on another side if a different part of the maze was cut too close to your hiding spot. But it seemed we had made it to one of the outer edges of the map, and as we slowly treaded our way into the corn, there were no signs of another path coming into view. Instead, there was just increasing darkness and the claustrophobic feel of stalks pressing in on you from all sides as a dry, leafy smell filled your nose and coated your tongue. Jenny was holding my hand as we went into the corn, and I felt sure she could tell my own was sweating, but she never said anything, and as we settled into a spot to wait out anyone searching the maze, she gave my hand a squeeze. Thank you for doing this, Kyle. It means a lot. I could barely make her out in the dark, but smiled at her words anyway, squeezing her hand back. Sure thing. It's kind of cool. In truth, I could barely breathe in that place, my chest feeling like it was surrounded by a slowly tightening belt as the minutes crawled by. I checked my phone and saw that 20 minutes had passed. Speaking to where I thought Allison was next to me, I let out a dry croak. Are we good? No sign of anyone? Yeah, let's get back. Just be quiet, though. I started back the way we'd came the way I thought we had come at least, but I didn't see any break in the corn ahead of us. If anything, it seemed to get darker. After a few more feet, I knew why. There's a wall here. What? Allison was coming up behind me and I could hear the irritation in her voice. What the fuck do you mean a wall? She reached past me and put her hand against the brick wall. I... Heard her let out a breath, and suddenly her cell phone's light was on, illuminating a gray brick wall buried among the corn and going up at least ten feet. 
As she panned the light side to side, we could see that the wall stretched onto our left and right as far as the light would reach. What? I don't understand. We would have seen this, right? We would have seen the giant brick wall when we pulled into the parking lot. I think there's more corn on the other side. We both looked at Jenna as she spoke, her eyes wide. That's the only thing that makes sense. They must have more corn growing outside the wall, so from the ground it looks like it's just corn, when really the maze has walls in it. She bit her lip as she looked up at it. I don't know. Maybe it's so they can control how people come and go? Keep people from sneaking in without paying, I guess? I nodded, trying to speak with a confidence I didn't feel. Yeah, I bet that's it. It makes sense they want to keep people out that don't pay for a ticket. And it did make a certain amount of sense, even if something in my core said it was a lie. Either way, we know a direction that isn't blocked, so let's head that way and find our way out. I didn't know if that last bit was true either, as I thought we were headed in the right direction before when we'd hit the wall. Still, I turned left and stayed with the wall for a few more feet before veering away in a direction I hoped would lead us back to a path. And this time it did, and I found myself taking in burning lungfuls of the cold night air once I wasn't surrounded by the corn anymore. Jenny patted my back and I smiled at her. <laughs> I'm okay, just glad to be out of the corn. Looking around, I frowned, but I don't think I have any idea where we are. Allison took the map from me and started alternating between studying it and looking at the path we were on, trying to discern some unique featurette that would tell us which path this actually was. She stopped when the stillness of the night was pierced by the high-pitched squeal of a pig. We all looked at each other with anxious expressions. They called this place a farm, but it was an attraction, not a real working farm with livestock. Why would there be a pig out here? I was about to ask that very question when the music began. Strange, discordant music that would occasionally be punctuated by another cry from a pig or some other creature. And underneath it all, we could hear the low, throaty thumb of some kind of singing. I looked up at the inky sky as though it would help me place where the sounds were coming from. I couldn't tell much, but it was somewhere close by, somewhere in the maze if I had to guess. Now I did speak, my voice barely a whisper, and my own fear reflected in their faces as they looked at me. We're not alone in here. After a moment of conversation, we decided to head straight into the direction we thought would put us up somewhere between the entrance to the maze and the parking lot. We started moving, ignoring the path and just quietly pushing our way through the cornstalk walls of the maze while trying to stay oriented towards our goal. We were relying on our sense of direction and the brick wall to our right, our theory being that the wall was likely fairly straight, and if we kept it on our right, we shouldn't get turned around. The music and pig cries didn't lessen as we moved. If anything, they got louder. But I wasn't sure it was because we were moving closer to the source. It was almost like the air itself, or maybe the corn, was suffused with the sounds, and the longer we walked, the more I felt that the animal squeals were digging into my brain, and the eerie rhythms of the music and singing were worming into my bones. And then we hit another wall. Fuck, Allison said in a loud whisper. She turned to me, and I could see how upset she was getting. I wanted to hug her, but instead I tried to sound calm. It's okay. Let's turn left. This wall has to end because this is the side we entered on. There has to be a break somewhere, right? Allison and Jenny nodded and we went on. Between our intermittent walks through the deeper corn and my steadily rising panic, I was finding it harder and harder to breathe. Maybe that's why I didn't hear the footsteps behind us. I felt a hand close tightly on the back of my shirt as Allison whispered in my ear. There's someone behind us. I thought I heard them a minute ago, but I couldn't see anything. Then when we were at that last patch of corn, I know I heard someone else move the stalks after we were all out. My heart leapt, but I forced myself to keep walking. Jenny was holding my hands again, but she was on the opposite side of where Allison was talking, so I didn't know if she heard what my sister had said. I gave Jenny's hand a squeeze to get her attention and spoke in a slightly louder whisper than Allison's. There's someone behind us. 
and we need to run. Allison, hold my hand and we'll stay together. When you see a break in the wall, we turn and head for the parking lot. Allison took my other hand as I strained my ears for sounds from behind us. I couldn't be sure, but I thought I could barely make out the rustle of a heavy foot stepping on each of the dead corn leaves that littered the floor of our current path. Squeezing both of their hands, I whispered, One, two, three, go. And we took off running. Allison was faster than either myself or Jenny, but she slowed her pace as she realized she was going to pull too far ahead to hold my hand. I kept looking to my right, waiting for some sign of light or the world beyond the corn, but all I saw was darkness. It seemed impossible. The maze was big, but it wasn't that big. We were moving at a good rate of speed and had already been walking in this direction for several minutes before we broke into a run. The sounds of music and animals had receded for a time, but they returned now and seemed to come from everywhere. I began looking in every direction, desperate for some sign of escape, some indication that we were finally out of the maze. And then I saw light ahead of us. Almost crying with relief, I surged ahead, pulling Allison and Jenny along with me. We stumbled out into a large open circle somewhere deep within the maze. There were tall torches spaced around the perimeter. In the center was a small group of people wearing robes and carved wooden masks. Some of them were singing while others played odd instruments. But as we broke through the corn, two of them spotted and looked at us for a moment. I was so shocked by what I was seeing that it took me a moment to register that Jenny had pulled free of my hand and ran to the staring couple. When they removed their masks, I understood both more and less. It was Jenny's parents. She was hugging them and talking excitedly, though their conversation was in hushed tones that didn't carry to us over the sound of the music and singing. I heard a new squeal and realized that there were massive looming shadows back behind the people. Suddenly the music and singing stopped and the crowd parted for the shadows to step forward. There were boars, four massive black boars that all sported sharp yellow tusks that they swiped at the air. There were boars, four massive black boars that all sported sharp yellow tusks that they swiped at the air as they trotted forward into the center of the clearing. Their eyes seemed to gleam red in the firelights, and I felt my bowels loosening as they stared at us with their small evil glares. Not knowing what else to do, I looked at Jenny, who was absently patting one of the boars as she smiled up at her mother. Jenny, what is all this? She looked at me, her face hardening. This is what's necessary, Kyle. I know you feel scared and betrayed, but we don't have a choice in this. I shook my head, bewildered. What? Who is we? What are you talking about? She sighed and gestured to the group of people gathered around them. This is my real family. My parents and I are part of a very special group. I guess you could call it a religion, though that's not really right. But the patrons of our way of life, of our power and knowledge, they're losing a... She smiled ruefully and shook her head as her mother patted her shoulder. No, they've lost a battle against a stronger foe. There is a new king of hell, and we must pledge our allegiance to him before it's too late. One of the other people stepped forward and pulled off their mask, revealing the plump, dark-skinned face of a woman that looked like an elementary school teacher or librarian. That's blasphemy. The infernal order will be restored. I've tried to hold my tongue, but we should not be throwing our lot with that thing, even if it would let us. Jenny's father gestured, and one of the other masked figures punched the woman in the stomach hard enough that she doubled over under the dirt. Patrice, I've told you before. You're either on board or you're meat. Guess you've made your choice. He stroked Jenny's hair and in a softer tone. Honey, it's time to repair the vessels. Jenny nodded and looked up at a large bowl that was sitting nearby the ground. As if on cue, the boars all simultaneously knelt down and she began to dip her hand into the bowl and pull out a white paste of some kind. One by one, she painted symbols on the large, wide foreheads of the beast as her mother intoned some kind of prayer. Great hunter, new king of hell, we beseech you to take this offering in your name. 
take these creatures as your vessels. Use them for your ends and make their hunt your hunt. Their kills, your kill. And now, by the blood and the fear and the life that is consumed, that we pledge to serve you as we served the Infernal Court in times past. This we pledge. With that, she turned and pointed at Patrice. You're not part of this. You're now part of them. The meat. The prey. As one of the boars turned and regarded her briefly with the same hatred they had previously served for Allison and me. You're all fucking crazy. Allison had let go of my hand and took a step forward before a warning snort from the closest boar made her retreat. She pointed a finger at Jenny. You fucking bitch. We took you in. Kyle has done everything to make you feel better, and what? It's all a trick? A trap? Because you're all part of some satanic cult or some bullshit? Jenny smiled thinly at her and waggled her hand. Eh, technically, we're not satanic, but potato, tomato. Pretty much, yeah. Well, you should be saving your breath, you know, for the running and screaming. Allison stepped forward again, and I saw she had a small can in her hand. Pepper spray. Way ahead of you, cunt. She hit the button and quickly fanned it back and forth into the faces of the four boars. The maze echoed with her angry screams of pain, and Allison spun back to me and grabbed my arm. Go! We plunged back into the corn, my sister's speed and strength causing her to nearly drag me along as we went off into a new direction, from the way we started. There was no time or breath to spare for talking or planning. I was just trying not to slow her down as my lungs burned and my heart thudded in my ears. Almost like the end of a terrible dream, I thought I could make out electrical lights ahead. The ticket booth. I never saw the thing that tripped me. One moment I was up, still running and keeping decent pace with Allison. The next moment I was covered in dirt and gasping to reclaim the breath that had been knocked out of me. She stopped immediately and came back to pick me up. That was all the time the boars needed. A black blur swept by and drove her off her feet. She landed ten feet further away, having actually skidded out of the edge of the corn and bumped against a trash can filled the remains of that night's crowd. I crawled forward and got to my feet, intent on helping her, but as I moved past the last of the corn, two of the boars bore down on her again, impaling her leg and her side with their now bloody tusks. I screamed and went to attack them, to stop them from hurting her more when I heard Allison's voice. Go. Run. Now. Take them. I saw she was pointing with a twisted hand to where her pepper spray had fallen. It was attached to her car keys. I picked them up, planning on using the spray against the boars again, but a third was on her way now too, all of them stomping and cutting and biting as they tore her apart. It was too late, or at least that's what I told myself as I looked on in terror. So I ran, tears streaming down my face. I passed the ticket booth in the gate before turning to head into the parking lot. The boars didn't follow, and though I could barely see through my sobbing, I managed to find the car easily in the most empty lot. I got in and was cranking up when I heard a knock at my window. I jumped and looked out to see Jenny smiling at me. We got our two sacrifices, so the boars aren't coming for you. I'm glad that Patrice decided to pipe up. I didn't want you to be taken tonight. She looked slightly sad. I really did always like you the best, Kyle. I didn't want to roll down the window, so I just yelled through the glass. I'm going to fucking kill you. She said something else, but I was already slamming the car into reverse with the intention of running her over. I stopped to put it in drive, and when I looked up... I told my parents and the police what happened, but no evidence has been found. No suspects have been arrested. The cornfield has been abandoned, and Jenny has joined her parents as missing persons. I know that no one believes me, at least not the more fantastic parts of what happened. My parents think they were part of some crazy cult and that I either imagined or exaggerated the boars and the walls and the rest. I, I can't say I blame them. When they checked out the cornfield, they didn't find any walls or signs of animals out there. But I know what happened to me, what happened to my sister. And I know it's not over. Because I remember the last thing that Jenny said as I tried to run her down for killing Allison. For betraying us all. See you next October.
In the early 90s, I went to SMSU, MO State, for a time. I had a buddy who invited me to a party at his friend's house, which was a few miles away from the dorm I was living in. I decided to go, but I would have to walk since I didn't have a car at the time. Even though Springfield is a pretty big town, if you walk for 20 minutes in any direction, you may find yourself out in the sticks. So I start walking by myself on a freezing clear winter night. After about 15 minutes of walking down this empty street in the cold, I happen to look up at the sky. It was crystal clear without a cloud in sight. And I see this brown oval-shaped thing floating across the sky ahead of me, from my right to left. It had no lights and it made no sound. I would say it was about 100 feet up and traveling at a pretty high rate of speed. Again, this was a crystal clear night and there were no clouds out. It was traveling too fast to be a cloud anyway. I finally lost sight of it behind some trees and then ran the rest of the way to the party. I think I begged everyone there for a ride home after so I didn't have to walk down that street again. There's probably not a week that goes by that I don't think of that night. My story happened a couple of years ago when I decided to go ghost hunting while visiting my aunt and her girlfriend in Ohio. After looking around for a while, I came across a location we could explore without trespassing or walking around too much. Exercise is not my thing. If I'd had to run a demon, I'd probably choose to lie down and accept my fate. I found a location on a list of haunted areas somewhere on the internet. It was rumored to have been the site of an old orphanage. One of the stories I came across said that a woman had conducted demonic rituals within the orphanage and hence given it an even stronger reputation for being a paranormal hotspot. The orphanage, or whatever it was, had burnt down though. The only evidence that anything had ever stood there previously was a few stone blocks, the old crumbling remains of a foundation, I assume. Oh, and the paranormal beings, of course. The history of the location was in similar condition to its crumbling and broken remains. It was difficult to find the truth about what really happened here, but many sources had claimed that the people had gone there more recently to perform their own seances and rituals. That alone had piqued my curiosity, enough to explore it. We hopped in the car and drove off into the night ready to investigate. After about a 30 minute drive, we came to the dirt road that led to the location. To get to where the actual coordinates were, you had to drive across a stone bridge that stretched over a shallow stony creek. I remember feeling an intense sense of dread as we approached that bridge. It sent chills cascading down my spine. My feelings were validated as a rumble of nervous laughter spread throughout the car. We drove across the bridge and then parked our car on the dirt road and got out. As soon as I got out, I felt a strong urge to walk down the dirt road in the opposite direction of where the bridge stood. I've always been sensitive to energies, and I can sometimes even tell what's going to happen in the near future. I'm kind of psychic, or maybe just intuitive. Either way, I had a strong feeling that whatever was pulling me away from that bridge matched the energy of a young boy. I trusted my gut and followed the energy for a bit, but realized that it wasn't stopping and decided to walk back towards the bridge. On one side of the dirt road, there was a forest. We decided to explore a bit of it. We had come to find Scary and figured a creepy dark forest would be the perfect environment to make us shit our pants. We walked around for a while, pointing our flashlights at creepy looking branches and tripping over bits of old foundation, but we ultimately found nothing. My spidey senses were telling me to go back to the bridge, and I voiced this to the group. We made our way out of the woods and started walking towards the bridge again. I felt the same sense of dread as we approached, like I did last time. I felt heavy and dark, and the air felt colder against our skin as we walked closer. And that's when I saw it. A long dark shadow hovering above a block of cement right next to the bridge. I stared at it for a long while, waiting for it to dissipate, but it didn't. Finally, I looked away and took a couple of steps back, and when I looked back, it was gone. In the moment, I blamed it on my mind playing tricks on me, filling the darkness with shapes to entertain itself, but what happened after made me throw that theory in the garbage. We walked out onto the bridge with flashlights in hand and pits in stomachs. 
We passed off the soft whispers we heard as the creek babbling away, but I could have sworn I heard a low voice whispering my aunt's name, and she leaned over the side. My aunt said she felt an overwhelming fear of something pushing her over into the creek below as she looked over the side. I decided to ask some questions to the dark. I took out my phone and recorded some audio, planning to listen back to it later. I asked how old it was and what its name was and if it had wanted to hurt my aunt. Then I stood there with my eyes closed for a minute and tried to get a feeling for who or what this strange entity was. I found that it seemed ageless and dark, very dark, malicious even. It was then that terror had surged through my body. It felt as if something had started sprinting at us from the other side of the bridge. My aunt and her girlfriend had seemingly also gotten the same urge to run. My aunt and girlfriend had seemingly also gotten the same urge to run. My aunt pulled me by the arm and we ran back toward the car, making worried remarks and frantically trying to lighten the heavy darkness with panicked laughter. I looked back for a moment and saw the dark shape again, closer this time. I felt something tug at the fabric of my jacket and I gasped in fright. We booked it back to the car. We drove quickly back over the bridge and into sweet civilization. After we were safely in the car and we checked the time, thinking it had only been around a half hour, we were shocked that it had been much closer to two hours. I told everyone in the car that time loss is something that is often reported with demotic events. After thinking back on my experience, I realized that young boy's energy that I had felt at first was most likely a child trying to warn us about the entity on the bridge trying to pull us away and protect us. As for the thing on the bridge, I've come to think of it as a demon. The dark shape it took, the time lost, the intense feeling of dread that accompanied it, the way it seemed to threaten to push my aunt off the bridge, the way it tried to pull me back onto the bridge by my jacket, and of course, the way it felt ageless and infinite and inhuman, all led me to believe it was a demon. We haven't gone back to that location since, but something seems to be pulling me back. My curiosity is growing and something is telling me I should go and explore it a little more. Honestly, if I get the opportunity, I don't think I'd be able to resist. And that scares me. Whenever I tell this story, I always feel like I need to start with a disclaimer. I know it sounds hokey or like something I made up. I honestly can't even tell you that I for sure believe in ghosts. I can only tell you my experiences. So here we go. The women in my mom's family have a sort of sixth sense. Not in the I see dead people way necessarily. It's a lot subtler than that. My grandmother, mother, and two of my three sisters have told me about experiences they've had, usually with dreams. Though my younger sister did see a couple of to use the vernacular, manifestations when we were kids. For the most part, my own experiences have been in the form of a heavy, sinking sensation in my stomach, similar to the feeling of dread you get when you just know that you've forgotten something important. It's not a pleasant sensation, so I've always tried to avoid any place that brings that feeling on. And that worked just fine until I was working at a coffee shop about ten years ago. The coffee shop is located in what used to be a bar attached to an old boarding house popular with miners and loggers during the first part of the 20th century. The boarding house now operates as a hotel, and the building is owned by the head of the local historical society. Since it's on the historical register, it has to be kept as authentic to the period it was built as possible, which means that while we had electricity and running water, it was drafty as hell in the winter because they can't fully insulate the front of the building without losing their historical status. All that being said, it is a beautiful location, and I still love the history of the place. At the time of my story, I was working as the manager of this coffee shop and would go in before sunup to get ready to open, turn on the coffee machine, make sure the cups were stocked, that sort of thing. I was always the only employee of either the cafe or the hotel who was in the building at that time. On this particular day, I was standing in the alcove where we kept the paper cups doing a quick inventory when I suddenly heard my name, spoken in what sounded like a man's whisper, directly into my left ear. 
I mean, it was like someone was leaning over my shoulder and speaking right into the side of my head. At the same time, I got that sick dread feeling right through in the middle of my chest and stomach. I dropped what I was working on and moved to the opposite corner of the cafe. Once I had calmed down, I thought maybe the guy who worked the front desk at the hotel had come by early and was messing with me. But when I checked the connecting door, it was still locked, and it locked from the cafe side. It was also one of the pieces from the original construction and did not open quietly. When I looked around the cafe, I was still the only person there and all the doors were still locked. I finished opening and while I told the girls I was working with that day what happened, the rest of the day went on as usual. No more whispers. That was the only time my sixth sense, yeah it still feels silly to call it that, manifested so tangibly. I still get the occasional sinking feeling, but thankfully, no more attempted verbal communication. This takes place in Irvine, California, and the time is about 3 p.m. My girlfriend at the time, Lisa, and I are hanging out at her parents' apartment. She lived there with her mom and older brother, who weren't home at the time. The topic of dinner is brought up, and we decided to order some food and pick it up at a restaurant across the street. Lisa offers to walk across the street and pick up the food herself. Me, being the lazy boyfriend, agreed to stay behind. We'd gone to a concert the night before, and I decided to take a quick power nap while she's picking up our food. I assume my napping position on the couch, which was lying on my stomach, and Lisa walks out, leaving the door open behind her. I lay there for about two minutes before hearing someone enter the apartment. This couldn't have been Lisa. Her mom was out of town, so it must have been her brother. I pretend to be asleep to avoid a conversation. I hear him walk into the living room and into the kitchen, and then to each of the rooms with heavy steps. Back into the living room, he begins to pace the length of the couch. I remember thinking to myself, okay, I'm compromised, and that's it. Time to wake up from my false slumber. I try to move my head, then my arms, my leg, but somehow I've fallen into sleep paralysis. My heart rate increases as I hear steps get closer to the couch. I feel a presence near my feet, my breath becomes shallow. I hear what I can only explain as a deep pulsing ring. Then I feel the couch indent by my feet. He's standing on the couch and slowly walking up toward my head, my body shifting with each indent. Then I feel a heavy pressure on my back. I'm violently pushed into the cushion three times. Somehow I snap out of it and shoot up. I check the apartment. There's no one there. I'm so freaked out that I literally run back to my house about a mile away. I never told Lisa or her family the story and just typing it out gives me shivers down my spine. It isn't much, but I live in southwest Pennsylvania beside Chestnut Ridge. Though Bigfoot and UFOs are an occasional part of the area and our history, I went most of my life encountering neither. It was in 2015 that while driving late at night near Keystone Park, my brother and his friend came home one night saying they had seen a light in the sky and it moved with them, eventually passing over them and vanishing. My brother wasn't big on UFOs and didn't ever push the issue either, so I believed him but was skeptical of what he actually saw, thinking maybe it was a drone or something. Two years later, in July of 2017, my opinion would change. I was out with my friend D. It was midnight and we were on our way home. I decided to take a back road home, which put us on windy rural roads between Keystone Park and Latrobe. We live in rolling foothills, and as I crested one, both Dee and I noticed a bright star to the north of us, enough to grab our attention, but nothing of concern. After going ahead a bit, we noticed the light was being blocked by the foothills. However, if it were a star, it shouldn't have been from the angle we first saw it. It was then we noticed it was moving and exceptionally bright, as well as incredibly low. It gave the impression it was large, larger than a drone. D was astonished. Holy shit, he exclaimed. That's a UFO. I laughed and replied that it couldn't be. 
must be a helicopter. There was probably an accident in a field or something, and it was medevac. But he insisted it couldn't be. The more I thought, I realized it was very misplaced, and it wasn't landing, but instead staying behind small hills and moving slowly. So, using the rural roads, I made my way towards the object. It was here, on a pull-off in the middle of nowhere, that I stopped the car and said, well, you'll see when it comes out that it's a helicopter. After a few seconds, it did just that. It rose suddenly from a hill right beside us and moved towards us. Then it stopped within a hundred yards of us in the air, perfectly still. As we stared in amazement, I noted that it made absolutely no sound, nor was there downdraft as we'd felt due to its proximity. It had two sets of lights, a square of orange and a triangle of green. Both, I'd guess, were about five feet in size, but I was absolutely unable to see any shape to the object. I looked for any sign it was a helicopter, a cockpit, or a spotlight, or anything that would give me a clue as to what it might be. Yet, I couldn't see anything except for the lights. It stayed perfectly still, and we watched it for over two minutes. It had to be aware of us. We were the only thing around there, and directly below it. And then it suddenly moved backwards. It didn't spin or rotate and move. It simply went backwards until it reached a hill about 500 yards away, where it lowered itself out of sight. I tried to find another angle to see it from, and we drove a circuit of roads around that spot for the next 30 minutes. We saw no lights, heard no sounds, and never saw the craft again. What it was still baffles me to this day, and we both wonder what it was and why it was there at all. In 2005, my family and I were driving home to Lexington, Kentucky from Charleston, West Virginia. It was pouring rain in the dark, sometime between 8 and 10 p.m. As we were coming through Huntington, West Virginia, I saw lights in the sky. Not aliens or anything, just looks like a plane or a tower. Seems very low in the valley, though. I watched it silently for maybe five minutes, and my boyfriend asked me, What's that? I replied, I don't know, but it looks like a passenger jet. We watched for about 10 minutes, and as we were driving 64 West, coming out of West Virginia, as we got closer, we realized it was a passenger jet, huge, suspended in the air with blue and red lines. I saw both lanes, east and west, slowing down as if it was an accident, just red lights all ahead. We're pulled over and just stone still, staring at a jet in what looks to be a direct path into the valley to the right of the west lanes at what I think might be a 40 degree angle down, just at or below the mountain line. Hanging there, in the dark, rainy night, a jet plane, lights on, seems simple and yet diabolical at the same time. There we are, standing on the emergency land of an interstate, soaked in the skin, staring. I don't know how long we stood there, but some people stopped and left before we did. Someone took pictures because I saw the flashes. We put ourselves back into the car and drove off into the night, questioning everything we saw. The plane was every bit an American Airlines passenger jet, except it hadn't any writing or lettering. It had all the right stripes and color, though. I could even make out the lights of the cockpit to the cabin lights, and had all the starboard and port lights, too. Other people that night took pictures. I wish I could somehow see those pictures. I've written to paranormal and alien sites and told a few people. Some say jets have a way to hover and land. No, those people don't know what I mean when I say suspended over a valley. I grew up near an airport. I spent many nights stoned watching planes land. Others say it was the Marshall University plane, like it repeated itself and broke through the matrix. If you don't know the story of We Are Marshall, it's a plane of football players that crashed outside of Huntington, West Virginia. Tragic, true story. It's a movie. I'm not a conspiracy nut and don't believe that there are lizard people. I use Matrix as a catch for all different dimension talk. I have no idea what I saw. I can just describe what I saw. Planes don't hover like that, though. Helicopters don't hover like that. No sound, no wind. I use the word hang because that's what it looked like. A giant model airplane suspended in the sky. In the end, we just drove off. It was in my rear view for a few minutes... And that's it. It wasn't scary, but just bizarre. In the end, we just drove off. 
It was in my rear view for a few minutes, and that's it. It wasn't scary, but just bizarre. None of us spoke of it for the rest of the drive. For maybe two hours, we would just look at each other and shrug. <laughs>